Rapporteur. Starting from that side? Where are you starting from? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for, for being here on time. I hope you are not yet very tired from the morning sessions. So we, uh, we realize that the conference is going to be quite intense, uh, but uh, we hope that um, after this panel, uh, after, uh, after this, we would have much more interactive discussions and we will have a chance to involve uh, all of you participants. So uh, right now we are here to um, discuss the careers um, in weather, water and climate for women. So uh, we will discuss how to tap women's knowledge, how to involve them in research and service provision. We will talk about what stops them from taking careers in science and meteorology. And we will devise strategies on how to bring them from the margins of scientific uh, enterprise into the very center. In the times when science was an exclusively male domain, brilliant, creative, and brave ladies like Marie Curie, Rosalind Franklin, Lisa Metner, Maria Mitchell, Sofia Kowalewska, and I can continue this list on and on, we, we know many of these names of women who were making ground groundbreaking discoveries. They discovered new radioactive elements, revealing the structure of DNA explaining nuclear fission, discovering comments, and on and on. Today, many women, regrettably not all, uh, live in a radically different society, where they are free to study, choose a profession, dedicate their time to science, or participate in all sorts of political and social economic endeavors. And yet, statistics on the share of women in many of these domains today, from the classroom to the boardroom, paint a grim picture of their empowerment. Uh, women constitute only slightly, only slightly more than a quarter of the world researchers. They hold a tiny fraction of professionals in math and science at universities. Uh, they represent only 6% of chief executives officers in the top, top, ten, uh, top 100 uh, high-tech companies. Uh, and similar situation is observed uh, in our own WMO structures and all our own gover governance and national med services. So we are puzzled with this fairly constant under-representation of women in leadership positions and the key scientific and policy uh, uh, sectors. And we gather here to try to discuss what are the bottlenecks, what are the barriers, and try to find solutions. So you, you, you see in front of you four panelists, and one is yet to come. Uh, our our uh, friend Lakshmi Puri, who was uh, host, hosting the lunchtime forum. Uh, I hope she will take a little rest and join us in a little while. But here we also have, uh, again, I'm pleased to, to uh, introduce once again Her Excellency Mrs. Madahafa, who is Samoan High Chief and Senior Government Minister. She was introduced in the uh, opening ceremony. You all heard that. Uh, Mrs. Linda Makulini. Dr. Makulini is our prominent figure in meteorological community. She is permanent representative with WMO of South Africa, uh, and, and we have only few female representatives uh, of countries with WMO. Only few, and many of them, and almost all of them, are present here. 
So I would uh, like to show hands, but <laughs> yes, show hands. Female represent, thank you. Vida, uh, Laura, Linda, Agnes. So you know, you see, I know them all by name. And uh, well, it's no wonder, <laughs> but they're really easy to know by name. There are very few, and Lakshmi is joining us. And um, we also have a few, uh, a few ladies who have, who have raised up to the high elected positions, our vice presidents of technical commissions and regional associations, again, Vida. <laughs> and uh, there is also uh, vice president of CCL, but she's not in the room. Oh, you're in the room, hey, hello. Yeah, yes, and vice president of Commission of Agriculture Meteorology. So that is all. Almost, you know, <laughs> there are a few more, but very few, really. So thank you very much for, for, for also being with us, because uh, we, we need to learn from your, from your what, what brought you uh, into this leadership position. So, and now uh, Lakshmi is rejoining us again. Thank you very much, Lakshmi. Um, and um, last but not least, I have a pleasure to present you Professor Christian Rousseau, who is the Vice President of the International Mathematical Unit and uh, she also is a um, professor of the University of Montreal. So this is a panel. Uh, we also have uh, with us our rapporteur, uh, Professor Liu Meng, Vice President and Professor at China Women University. She's not going to be panelist, but she is going to, 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 to be a, a sort of a, a custody of all the thoughts and recommendations we would hear today and later on. Uh, before I attack the, the, the issue, let me just say right away, because our time is very short, uh, but it's important for me to say, we will have only one hour for this panel right now, but we are not going to stop discussing this issue with this panel. We hope and we actually uh, uh, expect that the issue of careers and uh, empowering women to the leadership positions uh, would come across all the other sectoral discussions. But we still want to have some specific discussions on the career. So to this end, we will have tomorrow lunchtime forum in our cafeteria. Uh, unfortunately, the space is limited and we have some, some, uh, some constraints in terms of logistics, but uh, I was informed that uh, we have some, some 20 more places uh, available for this lunchtime forum. So those of you who are interested to, to help us in this discussion tomorrow, please kindly register through the website. And in addition to this, we would have tomorrow after every, co every coffee break in the morning and the afternoon, cafe career discussion right here in the lobby. <laughs> so there will be me there, uh, one of our panelists, there will be rapporteur and few other people. So if you feel like you would like to join us for this discussion, you are very welcome. Uh, at least one hour after coffee break, we will be there. So, and now we start. Um, I would like, Lakshmi to, to apologize, to, to, to change in a little bit the order of, uh, of uh, our story. Uh, I intended to start with you, but uh, we discussed with other, other colleagues, uh, so you would really be most powerful the last. <laughs> so we, need, we, need to, we need to bring you to the point when you, need, when you will explain us uh, why we are not doing this right. So we would like to start with Linda Makulini. In WMO, uh, we have policy on gender mainstreaming. And we had a conference 10 years ago which adopted this, pol uh, which adopted this policy. And we are trying to, to do our best, but the situation is not quite fantastic. So uh, now we have all the data in hands, survey of member states, and also all the databases. And Linda, she is the chairperson of the panel of experts on gender mainstreaming of our executive council, which is governing body. So she is a very top person in our governments to look after this. So all the data are in her hands. Uh, Linda, please, what, would, what do we have in WMO? Uh, thank you very much, um, program director, Elena. I am tempted this morning, um, the deputy uh, secretary general indicated that um, in South Africa, we enjoy singing. And I was tempted to start with a song where we say, the more we are together, the happier we are. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, when we talk about uh, gender mainstreaming, we also look at issues of gender balance. 
My presentation is just a snapshot of how uh, the WMO has tried to lead by example in making sure that we look at uh, um, gender issues at a decision-making level, at a legislative and policy making, and also looking specifically at uh, the specialists themselves. So what we have done, uh, the presentation will be looking at, the, at what we've done over the last seven years. Um, during uh, 2007, the WMO sat around the table, the members during the Congress, and they established a policy on gender mainstreaming. And also in doing so, we also made sure that we've got a body that is going to be advising uh, the, 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 the Congress and also the Executive Council on how to implement the policy. Because one of the challenges that we are faced with, we tend to have legislations, we tend to have policies and frameworks, but the issue is the implementation of those. And we felt it was important for us to be in a position to implement this. There should be gender focal points. And I think, uh, uh, Program Director, it's very important to emphasize that uh, when we looked at this policy, we looked at it not only looking at the Secretariat, we also looked at the member states, looked at the regional association and the technical commissions on how they are implementing this uh, policy. We looked at uh, two uh, uh, approaches. One is an inter, uh, uh, integrated, integrating uh, gender issues across. The second one, I think uh, this meeting, this conference that we are having now, is also looking at setting agenda in terms of gender and uh, gender mainstreaming. So the combination of the two to have an understanding of what are the needs out there and how do we link those to ensure that we provide uh, necessary services when it comes to climate, weather, and water. Um, I, will, I will actually talk about the statistics. I've indicated that um, it is important for us to integrate uh, women in all the activities of the WMO. Looking at the, this figure, we have um, the different constituent uh, bodies that are there. I must say, um, looking at, at them, there are areas there where we have noticed a very good increase. And uh, we will be talking about issues of water. And it's very important to note that when you look at, um, how do you use this? When you look at uh, the Hydrology Commission, we, 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 there is a significant increase in the number of women participating. For example, with Hydrology Commission, increase of 14, percent, well, 14 to 25 percent over the last eight years. It's a significant increase, although we're still talking about participation that is less than 40 percent, but there is an indication that we are moving in the right direction. As we fly up in the sky, we also need to have comfort that the Commission uh, on uh, uh, Aeronautical and also Atmospheric Science, there is also an increase in number of women that are involved in some of these meetings. Looking at management, um, as indicated, that it's also important that we have women in decision-making positions where they actually drive the strategy of the WMO. You'll notice that we've got um, a, a number of uh, uh, these uh, management uh, groups that are, are responsible for the activities of the WMO. For example, we've got 17 of them working with our core, uh, core partners. And also, if you look at the Intergovernmental Board of uh, Climate Services that has just been established, I'm also glad to indicate that I'm also a co-chair of, 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 of that body. We, out of the 17 uh, working groups, it's only four that we believe that there's a gap where we need to have women. And if you look at the aeronautical, it's above 40% in terms of participation of women. 
and there are regional associations that are also taking the stride in ensuring that we have women in decision making. Looking at, at also um, the figure three, where we have the working groups, where we also have the experts in there. The same issue that we need to be looking at, and I think the other commission need to learn from those that are moving faster in ensuring that there is participation of women. Even in this area, where you've got experts that are working, the Aeronautical Commission is also leading. And I think it's important for us to learn from, from that. Looking at um, the expert panels for the, that are advising the Executive Council, we have a, uh, the gender. The gender one is uh, we have 83% women. I remember when I was appointed or nominated as a chair, I had an appeal to say we need to reverse that and move closer to 50-50, because we're actually talking about gender balance and both parties need to understand what needs to, to be done in addressing the issues of gender. But I'm happy and I want to thank the team, the panel, that has worked on all these activities for the last seven years. Um, Elena and the team, you've done a great job. And looking at the other one that is very important for us, which we need to note, training and education. The ETR, there it's 12%. And it's an area that is really important for us to advance women and also making sure that in terms of education, in all the different levels, we do have uh, women that are assisting and also men that are assisting in making sure that gender issues are addressed in even curriculums when we look at that. If you look at the audit committee of the, of the WMO, where we're looking at uh, strategic issues and governance issues, um, we, we've got women above 20%. And I think we will be moving, we are moving in the right direction, but there will be some uh, issues that I would like to discuss. This is the overall, when I looked at the constituency of uh, the organization, the governing structures that are there, we are trying our best to have gender issues in the agendas of the commissions, the regional association, and also having discussion of what is happening at the national level. Uh, looking at the Secretariat itself, my presentation I said I'm looking at both. The Secretariat, it's, no, it's, it's good to note that there's been progress uh, from 2004 to 2013 in terms of movement at a senior management level. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can see that if you look at figure five, uh, 5A, there's still a big gap uh, where we need to be moving above the 30s. Uh, to, for, 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 to have uh, women in that area. But I think there are some challenges that I will highlight. And if you look at the professional level, looking at the professional level, we, we do have, um, for example, we've moved at a senior management, management level uh, to below 20s to about 26%. But they, there is a need to move further. At a professional level, looking at all the levels, we've moved from around 20 to 38%. But if you look at the professional level, moving uh, at a very, very senior level, we still have a challenge in there. And the general serv services, that's where we have the highest percentage. And I think that we need to be turning around. Coming to some of the challenges uh, that we're faced with, which I also think there are opportunities, moving a little bit fast, uh, we need to make sure that there is participation of, uh, of, of, and commitment in terms of dealing with gender mainstreaming activities. It's very important. I think in the morning we talked about the financial resources, resource mobilization, and human resource coordination. It's, very, it's also an issue that we need to be looking at. Uh, one of the issues that is also an opportunity, as much as we see it as a challenge, is that when it comes to cultural and historical factors, some of the presenters in the morning, they talked about indigenous knowledge. How do we then factor in indigenous knowledge and also have an understanding of gender issues on how in the past they were dealt with? And then as we move forward, how do we use that successfully to break the barriers that are there? 
Another challenge that we're faced with is that when you look at the, at the gene pool of qualified uh, metrologists, hydrologists, we still have an issue of getting a number that is sufficient to take us to a level of gender balance. So I think at national level, at international level, these are issues that we need to talk about. And one of the other important issues is monitoring and evaluation. What is not monitored? Uh, we don't have. And the other probably important issue is looking at the impact of having issues on gender balance. So I think uh, to, to finalize the recommendation, it's one we should continue with the coordination, looking at the gender policy. And I think as we have discussion as the WMO community, we also share ideas and do cross-pollination on how different governments are dealing with the, with the issue of gender balance. Mm -hmm. And also the other challenge that we've been faced with, including the WMO, but I think I must thank members because where there is a will, there is a way. We didn't have the budget for all the activities that we have, but we had organization or member states that were willing and made services to provide uh, uh, the, the, the necessary resources to continue with the, with, with, with the activities. And I think for the WMO Secretariat, it's one area that we need to have to look at the fully fledged gender unit uh, to address that. And also one of the issues that will be important is that is to look continuously look at uh, identify gender parities and also when we have the policies in place we need to have implementation plans with the budget and the necessary resources that are required to do that in conclusion um wmo has identified that there are gender imbalances but I must say, uh, from, uh, as a PR of, uh, of, of, of the WMO, uh, we are actually putting great effort. I don't know whether Secretary General is in the room. I noticed this morning when the, the first group was presenting at the high level, it was 50-50. We had six presenters, three females and three gentlemen. Thank you, Secretary General. I know you continue to drive that agenda. And also looking at the focal points, and I think that is also important. And also looking at assisting, working with PRs in committing, in making sure that we actually move with the implementation of this policy. Uh, borrowing from um, our hero, my hero, our hero, Maya, Maya Angelo, uh, she says how it is important for us to recognize and celebrate our heroes and she heroes. <laughs> So it's also very important as we talk about gender, we understand that we are talking in terms of females, but there is also a male dimension. Thank you very much. Linda, we do, we do thank you very much. It's actually amazing how this uh, quite dry figures could be presented in such a passionate and entertaining fashion. <laughs> So uh, I thank you very much for this. Uh, uh, we also have uh, in WMO actually the results of the survey, what happens on the member side. Linda presented uh, on uh, gender, uh, uh, gender perspective of what comes into our organization. But I don't want to give you too much figures, but just to say global average, <clears throat> the national meteorological services employ uh, women employee are not not raising 30 percent all over the world and that is that is uh, what we think are the roots of the problem and uh, and and with this i would like to now turn to unesco and we are very grateful that we were able to to have uh, one of the most uh, experienced person in unesco to try to explain us what happens on the side of science and on the side of research uh, I I'm very pleased to now uh, give the floor to uh, Ms. Korat. Uh, um, Gülser Karat is the director of the Division on for Gender Equality in the Office of Director General of UNESCO, who spoke this morning. Before joining UNESCO, she was an academic, a senior international development advisor to several international organizations. Most importantly, she was one of the organizers of the Gender and Climate Forum, which we had in the World Climate Conference. So there, she has a lot of connections with us, but she also possesses the, the data and knowledge which we really are eager to learn. 
So where is this scientific expertise? Is it there to come to our, um, our business? Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, first of all, uh, allow me to congratulate you and uh, the organizers of this conference, uh, which is very important and very timely. Uh, I think it's timely because we are looking at uh, uh, gender equality in uh, uh, an area which is, uh, in this case, the sciences. And I think it's a good uh, way to prepare us ourselves uh, for the uh, stock taking, which will take place next year. Uh, with the uh, Beijing plus uh, 20 process. Uh, you were here in the morning, I think, uh, uh, when our Director General spoke, uh, and uh, uh, I want to tell you that uh, at UNESCO, uh, we have made a lot of progress on uh, uh, promoting gender equality, on uh, supporting girls' and women's empowerment. Uh, UNESCO has been working in the area of uh, science uh, since its inception. It's one of the key areas of UNESCO's work. And we are very proud to have uh, gender equality as one of our two global priorities uh, since 2008. Of course, uh, the uh, uh, importance attached to gender equality increased with the election of the first Woman General Director of uh, UNESCO in 2009, Ms. Irina Bokova, who was here this morning. Uh, and uh, one of the things I wanted to say, it's not in my presentation, but after listening to the first speaker, I thought maybe I can tell you about UNESCO experience. In 2008, when we made gender equality a global priority for our programming, which is our work with our member states, we also decided to do what we preach, so we wanted to make sure that within the Secretariat we also have measures and uh, uh, active, proactive uh, uh, action to make gender equality a uh, reality. So we, we set a target to have 50% women in decision-making levels from uh, D1 and up. Uh, I'm happy to report, and we put a deadline, 2015 is the deadline to reach that uh, target. We are not there yet, but uh, one of the good things about setting targets with uh, deadlines is that it keeps everybody uh, on their toes. Uh, just uh, two weeks ago when we had our executive board, our member states were asking the question where we are at uh, with, uh, with that uh, target. And we are at the moment uh, in the low 30s, uh, but we got there from uh, very low 20s, so we are making progress. And it is one of the ways to make sure uh, they, we find the women, because we keep asking where are the women. Uh, they are there if we look for them. Uh, so the first question I was asked to address uh, uh, in this session uh, was whether there is a gender gap in the sciences. And then there, there are a number of uh, related questions. I will try to answer them very quickly. And uh, the related questions concern, you know, where does this gap start? Is it in primary or secondary school? Is it due to school enrollment? Is it due to uh, choice of subjects? So I will try to give you a very quick uh, general overview. Uh, globally, uh, well, the, the, the very short answer to the first question, whether there's a gender gap in the sciences, is yes. Uh, there is a gender gap, uh, as uh, Elena also mentioned. Uh, according to the most recent statistics from the UNESCO Institute of Statistics, about 30% of world's researchers, this is uh, people who are in, in universities, in research institutes, in think tanks, only 30% are women. Now, this is a very global figure, and it hides uh, serious uh, uh, regional variations. Let me give you some uh, figures from different regions. Most Central Asian countries report gender parity in the uh, scientific fields, and gender parity has almost been reached at 46% in Latin America. That is to say, 46% of researchers in Latin America are women. In Asia, the rate of female researchers is only 19%, and there are strong variations, disparities within regions. One of the uh, big variations is found in Europe, in Latvia, for example, female researchers constitute 54.7%, while the lowest uh, is 23% in the Netherlands. 
When we look at the question of uh, where does this uh, inequality start, where do we start uh, uh, seeing the uh, gender gap, I think uh, we can go all the way back. Uh, we can go back to the figures about uh, illiteracy. As you see here, uh, women represent two-thirds of the world's 795 million illiterates. And this uh, percentage, two-thirds percentage, has not changed in the last 20 years, even though we have made a lot of uh, uh, progress uh, with uh, education in, in general in other areas. So there are about 500 will million women in the world today, adult women, who cannot read or write. Now, what of uh, the next generation? Are they more likely to be literate than their mothers? As we all know, there has been progress in access to schooling. Uh, there is increased primary school enrollment. Uh, gender parity has improved, but gender disparities continue. According to UNESCO's recent global monitoring report, which tracks progress in education, girls are still less likely to enter primary school than boys. One of the most alarming findings of our uh, uh, global monitoring report in 2014 was the fact that in poor rural areas of sub-Saharan Africa, we will have to wait uh, well after uh, the year 260, 2060 to have all school-age girls enrolled in school. This is a long time uh, to, to come, so it gives us an idea about the uh, uh, gravity of the situation. The gaps widen at secondary level. Only about one-third of countries for which we have data have achieved gender parity at secondary level. Alarmingly, in some countries, the dropout rate for girls from school has increased over the last decade. This is despite the fact that we have all these education for all education first initiatives. There are currently 39 million girls aged 11 to 15 who are not enrolled in either primary or secondary education. To put, those, uh, to put that uh, figure in perspective, 39 million girls represent half of the population of France, if you take France as, a, as, a, uh, as an example. Again, there are very serious, very strong national and regional disparities. And, uh, but as a general uh, uh, rule, we can say without uh, much uh, hesitation that in most regions of the world, women are more likely than men to be uneducated or undereducated, especially in regard to science and technology. Now, what happens to women and girls as they move up further in the education system? As we all know, tertiary education plays a vital role in launching women into scientific careers in academia or elsewhere. Here, the situation is more complex. There is a well-used and highly appropriate <coughs> metaphor of a leaking pipe used to describe the drop in the percentage of women who remain in science as they move from university to research and careers in science. At university level, the pipe leaks more heavily for some subdisciplines, so there is horizontal segregation at the university level. Although the overall number of women enrolled in tertiary institutions has been growing rapidly since the 1970s, this does not translate into uniformity across all academic disciplines. We know from recent studies that although one third of countries which report uh, on uh, figures enrollment in the tertiary level, there is gender parity at bachelor's degree or equivalent, this figure plummets uh, down, to, uh, down considerably and uh, in 91% of the countries with men, uh, with uh, data, men dominate in 91% uh, of the uh, enrollment. So strong variations persist between subdisciplines. Engineering and computing remain almost exclusively male preserves. On the other hand, life sciences, including medicine, are dominated by women in nearly three quarters of countries. I will give you just one example from the UK because we have this uh, as, a, as a case. Uh, there's a decline in female students studying engineering now in 2014, fewer than one in seven students, in contrast with the female domination of medicine and dentistry courses in which 58% of students are women. 
The pipe continues to leak as we move up. Uh, at master's level, we lose more women, and as uh, at the PhD level and beyond, uh, uh, sciences become really uh, a predominantly a male reserve. Preserve. The trend continues as UNESCO found that women account for, as I said in the beginning, about 30% of the world's researchers. I must admit that we don't have uh, uh, specific figures for uh, uh, meteorology, uh, water, uh, climate, but I can tell you one example that for which we have data. In 1985, 37% of computer science degrees were earned by women. In 2008, this dropped to 18%. It, it was halved. And, uh, you know, common sense, uh, conventional wisdom would uh, tell us that it would increase. It, just the opposite happened. It, it uh, uh, was cut down by uh, half. Why is this happening? We also hear a lot of uh, uh, anecdotal evidence. I always forget to do this. Uh, why does this happen? Because we were at a conference uh, not so long ago, about a month ago, uh, Lakshmi Puri was there too. We, we were talking about information and communication technologies and uh, uh, education in those areas. And we were told over and over and over that uh, less and less uh, numbers of young girls and women want to study science. And uh, one of the reasons that uh, w uh, was given for, for this uh, uh, was the uh, societal attitudes and how they affect one thinks of himself or herself, and in turn, how one thinks of himself and herself affects others who look at you in that area. I will just uh, touch on a few things and then uh, conclude. Uh, when we look at boys and girls, uh, it seems that at age 15, there is already a marked differentiation between their aspirations. At that age, it's found that boys are more interested in bombs and careers in which they can build and repair things, whereas girls show more interest in things like plants and in working with people. So it's not difficult to, to, to see how these preferences translate into a male leaning towards physics and engineering and a female leaning towards biological sciences. These attitudes will affect how a woman is treated as she progresses in her studies and career. Uh, and her chances of success in that career. For instance, research has found, and we have all heard about this research, research has found that when presented with two identical CVs, the only difference being that one is marked with a male name and the other a female name, both male and female evaluators rate the man more highly. To put this in the words of a female pr professor at MIT, uh, she says equal talent and accomplishment are viewed as unequal when seen through the eyes of prejudice. I, we may come back to some of the things I wanted to talk about, which is how these attitudes are uh, strengthened and perpetuated uh, through two uh, areas on which uh, UNESCO works. One is education and the other is media. But I'll skip those and I'll just uh, mention uh, something uh, as uh, by way of conclusion. When we look at women and uh, scientific careers, we see that women are missing from all levels of education and, and from science careers in, the, in most parts of the world. They are missing at rates that seem to increase as they embark on the difficult journey through the leaky pipeline that leads to a science career. When we ask ourselves and when we ask them why they are missing, when we explore the challenges uh, that those who have succeeded have had to overcome, the same common thread returns. Sociocultural understandings of male and female roles in society frequently conflict with women playing an active role in science. So there have, uh, we have to come up with measures, uh, practical measures, from helping girls transition to secondary school, improving the quality and gender sensitivity of teaching, and teacher training uh, to, provide it, uh, to providing career guidance, scholarships, and role models. But I think at the end of the day, we should look at all these practical uh, measures within a, a broader framework, within a more holistic framework, uh, in terms of the kinds of actions we need to take to promote gender equality. And I'm sure my UN Women colleague will uh, go into more detail about that. 
This is one of the reasons why UNESCO has made gender equality a global priority, because uh, what we believe is that uh, uh, we have to mainstream gender equality into everything. Uh, in this way, every action becomes an action in favor of gender equality, and perhaps directly or indirectly in favor of finding those missing women in science. Thank you very much. Good, sir. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, yeah, I was really he hesitating to, to show you the sign of time or anything like this, because uh, this is information which we would only learn from you. And it's very sorry that you can stay with us longer, but I know that your colleagues are here and uh, Anatea would, uh, would pick up the estafette, perhaps, I hope, if, if she can. Uh, thank you for that. So um, before I go to, to, to our next speaker, uh, I'm going to give us early warning, colleagues, because early warning is about in, in 15 minutes we are supposed to give room to disaster risk reduction session. It's in the same room, so the more, we, the more time we take, the less time for them would be to, to reduce the risk of disaster. So <laughs> let, us, <laughs> let, let us just balance wisely. Uh, but but, I, can't, uh, but I, I, would, I really ask you to tell us about the sheroes, because what, um, what Professor Rousseau is going to speak about this famous women in science, which is one of uh, in mathematics, who, who are really, you know, uh, very, very uh, having distinguished careers and uh, very good uh, role models. You have a floor, please. Okay, so why, uh, why a mathematician am I here? Well, I train teachers, so the teachers, we try to tell them that mathematics is everywhere and they should convey the message. When we try to, to attract uh, students to the university, we tell them, well, with mathematics, you can go to every other job, including meteorology, climate. Uh, one message I want to carry, certainly, is that uh, well, I see around here a lot of women that have leadership roles. And I think that as women, we can have leadership roles in a different way. We have our distinctive uh, way of doing things, and this is something we can bring to society. So, for instance, uh, I, a woman, I organized an international year. It was Mathematics of Planetus. So it was last year, maybe you didn't hear, but we were having activities all around the planet. So, scientific activities, it could be inside meetings, workshops, uh, programs, activities for the public, activities for the schools. Why did it work? Why did it become an international year? Well, two ingredients, a vision, and something very important, an unprecedented collaboration of the partners. So the vision. Well, the team is very broad. Maybe uh, I'll just tell the uh, next slide what we mean by mathematics of planetus, but it looked attractive. And in fact, mathematicians are not uh, used to think that they their discipline has so much links with the planet. It was also one of our uh, goal was to attract mathematicians to all the, question, the research questions that are uh, related to the planet and to call uh, to mind that they have a role to play in the future of the planet. So this was one of the posters for the year. So four themes, a complex planet. You have oceans, climate, etc. But also uh, biologically diverse planets, so all the questions where mathematics has to do with ecosystems, biodiversity. A planet structured by civilization, where mathematics is there to organize health systems, economic systems, financial systems, energy. And now we meet the team of this conference, a planet at risk, so all the climate change and the disaster risks. Model of functioning, we had an international year with no budget. So it was a new uh, model we would put forward. Uh, the power of joining forces. So it was a delocalized model. All the partners, they could be research institutes, learned societies. They had to be convinced with the vision and then they were putting their resources to organize the event. So the structure was completely delocalized. One, uh, partner would have the website, another one would have the exhibition. UNESCO had a day on mathematics of planetaries. 
it has some uh, consequences. So we have a lot of uh, network that, networking that has happened during that year and that is continuing. And uh, uh, so it has really attracted the attention of mathematicians. Uh, we want to attract uh, uh, students to mathematics and to science. We should put a human face, so just a few of one. Uh, Inge Lehmann, a Danish mathematician, she discovered the inner core of the Earth in 1936. So the inner core is some solid part in the interior of the Earth. Uh, presently, the first uh, woman uh, president of the International Mathematical Union, Ingrid Dobshi. Uh, this year, we would celebrate the, uh, Maria Mirzakhani, an Iranian uh, mathematician. She was the first woman Fields medalist, and the Fields medal is considered as the highest prize in mathematics because there is no Nobel Prize. Uh, two women in a row, the first uh, a female president of the International Council of Industrial and Applied Mathematics. So the one on the left is the present president and the other one is the uh, president-elect. Uh, you may have heard of the carbon market of the Kyoto Protocol. Maybe what you don't know if it, uh, it was written, uh, conceived by a, an economist, but she was first a mathematician, so Graciela Cicilnitsky. So how can we attract uh, more uh, students to mathematics, but I could say to science, starting and more girls, starting with schools. So uh, but what is mathematics? What is science useful for? One message we have, mathematics is a living discipline within science and technology, and we should have more contacts with the teachers and the researchers so that they could feel how the... Uh, how it's, it's becoming exciting with all kinds of applications. The power of uniting forces. We shouldn't work in a separate, uh, we should work all disciplines together. We should work all levels together. So the scientists, we should talk to the teachers, we, co we should talk to the teachers, educators. We should wo work men and women together to have a stronger message. So I have presented some of the pioneers. There is room for women in mathematics and planetary, planetary issues. My main message to all the women who are here, trust yourself, decide to bring your distinctive and creative contribution. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Professor Rousseau. Thank you, Christian. You said that um, I, I loved your last uh, one of the, well, I loved everything, but one of your last point was it's good to teach in school what mathematics are use, useful for. And uh, I think that I'm happy that our minds crossed here once again uh, because uh, one of the brochures which we circulated for this conference is career meteorology. Well, it doesn't talk uh -huh. about it, it doesn't talk about hard hard hours of studies and tough mm. statistic studies, mm. but it talks about why why meteorology is a nice profession, why it is excited world to live in. Mm. So I think this is very very powerful message to give. Now we turn to the government, to the big government on the small Pacific Island state. And the lady who, who, who is now going to take the floor, I introduced her largely in the opening. She is uh, one of the most experienced member of the cabinet, so she has a story to tell, and it is still a surprise for me what, what exactly. <laughs> um, thank you, Elena. I'll be very brief, because I would really like to hear from, from the meeting delegates. Um, perhaps I can just speak in terms of science education. And thank you very much for the global figures on, um, especially on, on, on science education. Uh, my country, like many other countries, um, has given priority to science education uh, because it brings a particular set of skills uh, for development requirements. We are very challenged, though, as a small country, um, even to launch um, quality science education from the very basic levels um, through to, to even tertiary levels. 
Um, but nevertheless, um, we, we try and make the, the provisions um, and the policy frameworks um, to ensure that um, science education um, is there and available. Um, quite apart from the issues of the uptake um, of science, especially by girls. Um, in terms of um, gender access to science education, um, our government is very clear on its policies uh, to ensure that there is a gender balance in terms of um, what is made available um, to our students. Um, and this is also further assisted uh, by our donor partners when they, they are contributing to uh, particular programs or scholarships, um, that they do have a requirement that there is um, a, a gender parity um, for those who take up opportunities to study. Um, one of the things I just wanted to talk about um, with science education, and apart from the resourcing uh, issues uh, from financial through to human resourcing, um, one of the things we did note, um, and I was a minister for education for quite a lengthy period, uh, was that science was perceived by our students as something foreign. Um, and there were, of course, issues to do with language because um, most of the material is in English and uh, English is not our first language. Um, but also because um, science and mathematics in particular is highly conceptual. So, you know, your, your language skills um, have to be quite evolved um, uh, to be able to uh, take that um, education in. And also just the, the mindset also that, um, you know, science is very foreign. And so in discussing these kinds of issues with our curriculum people, we really had to look at you know, how the curriculum um, could be developed using local and perhaps more indigenous um, examples of science. You know, that we did not see it necessarily as science, we just saw it as a, as a traditional practice of some sort. And so part of that mindset too is about valuing what you know. Um, and because a lot of the knowledge was foreign knowledge, um, it, it, there was that disassociation um, in the mindsets of students and perhaps teachers as well um, around the whole area of science education. So um, one of the other elements too in terms of government policies on human resource um, development is that there's quite a, a broad range of discussions around um, can you actually manipulate um, through policy the choices that people make um, you know, in areas that they want mm -hmm. to study in. Um, because if we looked at the data of, and the choices that our students were making, um, they leaned very much more towards um, sort of the social um, subject as opposed to the more uh, technical and, and scientific um, fields. Um, so we have a proliferation of uh, lawyers, doctors, um, and not too many um, of the technical fields, uh, especially in science. Um, and, and, and this is a challenge for us, although the social scientist would say um, that there is equal value to the social sciences, um, to those of the more pure sciences. Um, in physics and math mathematics and chemistry and so forth. So um, I'm not sure, Elena, if, is, if this is very helpful to the discussion, but you know, those are some of the issues that I think governments do face and in our particular 
uh, experience uh, as a small uh, Pacific state. Um, just some of the, um, the issues I thought you know, might be in part of the discussions that we're having here. Um, the comment uh, that was just made lately about people bringing their creative contributions um, to whichever field um, is, um, I think, a very um, apt comment to make. Um, especially if we're talking about sciences, I think I said earlier today that in, in taking forward the message of taking up climate services and the information that is available to better inform our decision making, I don't think we do need to be scientists and specialists, mm -hmm. but we do need to be interested citizens um, about the issue and, and to take the message forward. Um, and that we should use the, the situations of influence w where we are situated uh, to bring those messages to our respective communities. So that's my short contribution. Thank you very much. Much. It's, it's actually a great short contribution and the issues you have uh, raised about foreignness of the curriculum, need of uh, per personal touch and indigenous touch, and also not everyone needs to be scientists but meteorologists. I think that there are things which, which we don't hear every day and that it's not something in the surface. I recall that the Mr. Jarot, in many of his uh, speeches, uh, uh, he sometimes uses. Uh, the, um, the, how would I say, the, some anecdotal phrase to say that uh, he believes that every citizen in the world is meteorologist because without being the scientist in meteorology, everybody is meteorologist. And uh, I also used uh, in the, one of the gender uh, events in the Conference of Parties of UNFCCC that uh, I believe that every mother is meteorology because it's the mothers who first worry about how to wear the kid and what to put on the kid, you know, if it's rainy or it's uh, dangerous outside. So, and I was saying that your first teacher in meteorology is your mother, actually. Yeah. And I said, well, actually, why not? Yes, it is. Yeah. So this is, that is actually an interesting perspective to, to turn this whole thing into, into how, how we participate all in the meteorology at large, mm -hmm. <laughs> if I may say that. Mm -hmm. So with, with, my, with my all the respect to, to disaster risk reduction panel, please let me, uh, uh, let, let me give a floor to, to our last speaker, Lakshmi. And uh, she has been very prominent this morning. So, but for, for this particular session, she, she would help us to understand better the barriers and structural inequalities and social biases. Just in a few words to, to complete the picture. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm glad you asked me to take the floor last because I could benefit from the wisdom of all that has been said from different perspectives. This is a fantastic panel. And uh, in fact, we go back much enriched from what the contributions have been. And um, speaking as uh, someone who is a, shall I say, failed or frustrated scientist to be. I mean, I wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be, uh, you know, into the, I, I wanted to go into the scientific field, biochemistry in particular. Um, some of it could be related to climate and weather uh, sciences. But uh, I was told, my, my father was a feminist, but he said this is a long career. You never know what kind of uh, you know, um, job opportunities you will have at that time, and this was in the 70s. And then he persuaded me to take the, you know, the administrative services and, and foreign service exam. So I got diverted from science into this. But that's the kind of mindset. So what are we looking at? We are looking at, from all what you have said, we are looking at, A, the mindset uh, within families and, and in, in society. And that's why it's very important that you have raised this question. What is the social norm about uh, science, technology, and, um, and, and the, the related uh, areas of, and disciplines? 
as being gender friendly because I think there is that element. It's, sometimes it's discrimination because you don't think women are up to it. But sometimes it is also genuinely about, as, as you were mentioning and others were mentioning, it is about all those long dogged hours uh, that you have to spend in trying to master uh, this, uh, um, you know, science. And, you know, Madame Curie used to be my, you know, very big uh, uh, hero. And then I read about her life and, and the kind of discrimination she faced uh, on, on a, even after becoming a scientist. So this is, this is one issue to be addressed. How in society, how in families do you look at women and girls turning into scientists? And in this particular case, the, in the scientists, uh, science, education, and technology to ensure that they become catalysts and developers and users of weather, water, and climate services provided, of course, by WMO in this case, and its members to serve the global community on an equal basis. The second issue, so this, you know, how, and there you have identified how the girls themselves look at these kind of careers or these kind of educational path, the value chain from education to careers, and also how the rest of them, the rest of society, uh, portrays uh, women's role in that. So that is one first, uh, you know, um, issue to be dealt with. The other uh, issue is uh, the Beijing platform says that, uh, you know, there is a whole section on science and technology and training, education and training, and it says, education, participation in decision making, and the role of women in the environment are critical areas of concern. So this is something that we have to, and, and it, there are CSW resolution on science and technology, agreed conclusions that were passed in 2011. And then there have been several general assembly resolutions on this. Now, the issue is, why is, the discussion relevant. And I'm so happy that WMO has raised this as an important issue. I know disaster risk reduction is very important too, and that is the context in which we will operate. But the people, the women uh, serving that uh, area are also. It's important as we discussed this morning because women matter in climate services and, and, and weather services. Uh, and they matter not only because they have differential needs and are disproportionately impacted, but also because their agency being undertapped right now. It's very clear from your presentations that with all the efforts that are being made, we are still uh, not even reaching the critical mass of 33% that Beijing uh, you know, uh, says must be reached to constitute at least it's a good progress towards parity, let alone parity. Second thing is that it is this, this whole educational field. Today, uh, this morning, DG UNESCO and also uh, the uh, DG um, uh, the, uh, WMO and now my dear friend from UNESCO once again uh, highlighted the importance of education and STEM education in particular. And there, again, there is uh, inequality. An inequality of orientation and norm, you know, norm, social norms somehow acting against it and the, there is inequality in terms of uh, incentivizing women and girls into science and technology education. And I think that was what was referred to. The, the state can do some things, but also we need to create the kind of incentives 
to get women to choose, girls to choose to go into science and technology and to provide. So it has to be a two-way street. Uh, the other, other issue is um, it's an it's a issue of human rights, and you would wonder why, but it's, it's an issue of human rights in terms of women and girls' right to education and equal access to scientific and technological knowledge and skills. Even if you don't want to go into that profession, as you said, it is something that we ought to know because we are living in a climate-challenged world, weather-challenged world, and it has such a deep impact on every aspect of our life. It's also an environmental imperative to ensure women's greater role as both providers and users of cutting-edge meteorological science and in meteorological professions. It's critical to ensure that gender equality is a component of scientific and technological activity and outcomes. And this is an economic imperative. As the global economy, as well the management of crisis, including on food security and climate change, are increasingly driven, driven by knowledge and science. And as I said, in 2011, the Commission on uh, Science and Technology also affirm that access to and participation in science and technology as the priority theme, and it provides important policy guidance, and of course, I'm not about to repeat everything, and of course, you have access to. Now, you have already referred to statistics regarding women's involvement in STEM, particularly areas associated with weather, water, and climate. So, uh, but I'll just want to mention a few uh, women's agency on sustainable development is increasing recognized as women's strong body of knowledge and expertise in water and weather management, climate change mitigation, disaster reduction, and adaptation strategies. Also, their responsibilities in household and communities as stewards of natural and household resources positions them well to contribute to livelihood strategies adapted to changing environmental strategies. But this is the traditional mold. Yet, statistics regarding women's involvement in STEM associated with weather, water, and climate continue to show women's underrepresentation. And now, and, and of course, Linda has uh, shown how uh, WMO has tried to rectify this, but UN, United Nations system as a whole has been slow, but, and, and also UNESCO, the emphasis on gender equality in STEM education, uh, in the representation of women, we have a responsibility to lead by example, as the Secretary General reminds us. And looking at three UN organizations dealing with environmental issues, UNEP, UNFCCC, and WMO, we see a range from 37% to 45% of women among professional staff, which is good. But both UNEP and WMO have currently 30% women at senior levels from D1 to USG. And at the national level, limited progress has been made in promoting women's participation in environmental decision-making in public <coughs> and private institutions. And of course, uh, the DG referred this morning to the SWAP, system-wide action plan, and how WMO is uh, transforming itself in, in order to meet the, the, in the targets and indicators established under the system-wide action plan on gender equality. And one of those indicators is the status of women, the representation of women. So um, the underrepresented, but at the national level, we really need to address this. The underrepresentation or absence of women in high-level decision-making organs in the environment sector, again, we, we saw, I think, uh, a presentation on this in an earlier panel, how women are underrepresented, but also now, uh, has, has severely limited women's contribution to environment policy development, including adaptation and mitigation strategies on climate change and technical skills, resources, information, particularly in rural areas, has impeded women's effective participation in impact on decision-making on sustainable development. By the way, you know, the goal on sustainable 
consumption and production patterns that the international community is seeking to adopt in the post-2015 development framework, how can you get there without women being enabled and equipped to get you there? So that is really the key. Now, measures can be taken to build, and I'll come back to our theology, and it's not just theology, it works. That's the theology of temporary special measures. You need to take special measures at every level. In terms of campaigns, you have to take, uh, engage in campaigns, public campaigns, to incentivize, to inspire, produce role models, tell, them, tell girls that it's not so difficult, and in fact, it's exciting. You have to do, um, you know, provide special scholarships, support systems to women and girls in order that they can get into this. And also provide, uh, you know, uh, have established quotas in, in universities, uh, you know, so that their access, sometimes they can't make the grade. You know, all scientific and technical universities anywhere around the world have very high threshold and they are becoming more and more competitive. So unless you provide some opportunity to women and girls to enter with some kind of affirmative action, we won't get there. So what are the barriers? We have already talked about challenges in recruitment, retention, promotion, and recognition. So I won't go into all of this, but that also looks at this whole uh, area as a male uh, domain. This space is regarded as a male domain, male-dominated occupation. So that leads to what we normally call segregation in occupation or occupational segregation. And, uh, and then the whole issue of networks and leadership. See, employers may rely on predominantly male networks. Women's career opportunities may be hampered by requirements of research work, insufficient attention to care responsibilities. You know, that contention between reproductive role and productive role. Uh, measurements of performance may be gender biased. Women researchers may obstacles face obstacles to funding for their research. So all these are obstacles. Recommendations, what recommendations can this conference make? Full and equal access to quality education in science and technology, including STEM, is of great importance at all levels of education. Within schools, hands-on experimentation and collaborative work in classes is a tool to address gender-related stereotypes, which need to be demolished. Increasing the quality of education for women and girls is essential, and investing in teacher training, curricula, textbooks that are gender sensitive. Exposing girls and boys, women and men, to successful female role models, as I already said. Um, and then we also need to promote positive image of careers in science and technology for women and girls including mass media, social media, sensitizing parents, students, teachers, career counselors, curriculum developers. And great need to develop career advisory, networking, and mentoring programs. By the way, I went for one, and I got, in fact, a negative feedback. So we have to have the right kind of <laughs> career counseling and networking programs. We must increase transparency and fairness in science and technology employment and decision making by setting clear criteria for recruitment, promotion, and awards, and also do away with the bias of recruiters and employers. And high-level high decision making, again, I think we have to do what we are trying to push in parliaments, what we are trying to push at, at all levels of governance, but also in corporations, in the boards, we are trying to push for quotas. In, in Norway, they have set uh, a require, mandatory requirement that if you don't have more than 40% women in your board, you are delisted from the stock exchange. So you have to have some kind of, uh, a, you know, some kind of either targeting or requirement in many of these institutions. Uh, and, uh, and it's not as if we are you know, favoring the less qualified. 
let's also be very clear. When women and men are equally qualified, women should be given a, a chance and, and, in fact, uh, a preference. So I think this is something, and in fact, women can bring something very special, additional to uh, this task, and this is something that we keep affirming. So what I, I would like to end now, I know time is passing, and I would like, I would like to end now by saying that we really value the, uh, uh, this discussion the, and whatever recommendations come out from those who are out there in this field, in education, related field of, on this, those who are in the normative uh, space, social norms as well as political policy making, uh, legal norms, and also those who are, like us, in the UN system, trying to promote the new norm, the new normal on uh, women's participation in STEM education, and particularly weather and climate-related re services, and, and uh, science and technology related to that. Thank you. Well, uh, Lakshmi, thank you very much. Now, as moderator, I have a very challenging moment because I'm supposed to summarize the points. So, but I would like to say right away, I'm not going to, because first of all, the panelists have been uh, giving very sharp recommendations and uh, they, we, we can collect them all. Secondly, uh, you have also in the toolkits uh, a list of questions which we would like to solicit some answers should you, should you wish to share them in writing. And in the very beginning of today's one-hour discussion, I said that this is not the end of discussion. This is only the beginning. We, we will wait for you tomorrow at lunch forum, tomorrow in Cafe Careers, and any time, actually, I'm, I'm not in physically involved in other sessions, any time from now till the closing. So I, I, I'm sure that you were not expected this uh, short one-hour panel to be interactive. We were not, uh, it was not feasible to do that. So we start. Uh, let us just warmly thank uh, our presenters. I think we all enjoyed and learned a lot from, from their uh, insights. Thank you very much for, for being with us and uh, for remaining to be with us, uh, some of you. Thank you. And now I have a question to pose to you. So we, are, we, we have actually um, over, um, taken the coffee break. Should you wish to start 15 minutes later with disaster risk reduction but still have coffee break, but then you will finish later? So reception will still be waiting. Or you would like to start disaster right away with very short, just technical break. So yes, coffee break 15 minutes and finish later, or no. Or, should, or, or there, is there anyone to, to tell me? To, to, uh, maybe I should ask the chairs and moderators. What would be your preference? To, to continue right on or to take a coffee break? A few minutes later, okay, so we take coffee break, right? Yes, we have coffee break, but, but not very long, 10 minutes, okay? Thank you.
Good afternoon and uh, welcome to what I think is your third session today. And um, uh, maybe you haven't had enough breaks for lunch and other things, but I hope you come to this session with lots of energy and interest. Um, this panel is committed to have a dialogue with you, so we promise that there will be a chance for you to ask questions and make comments on what the panelists are going to introduce. My name is Margareta Wallström. I'm the head of UNISDR, um, and as such also, we have the responsibility to uh, organize, together with the host country, Japan, uh, the third World Conference for Disaster Risk Reduction, which happens in March next year. So today, um, in this session on strengthening women's role in disaster risk reduction, of course, we would like to focus also on disaster risk reduction. Um, but as I'm sure you are all very strongly engaged in the issue, you also know that disaster risk is one of the three strongly interlinked themes for 2015. 2015 is really about the sustainability of development and in 2015 we start the year with the conference uh, updating and renewing our disaster risk reduction framework, the Yoga Framework for Action. After that, just a few months later, the United Nations meet to establish what everyone is working on now, a universal framework, a universal plan for sustainable development. And thirdly, towards the end of the year, of course, the COP in Paris hopefully will conclude a climate agreement. Nevertheless, irrespective of these three big international conferences, the issues are critical and the interlinkages between the evolution of climate and weather, the development models, uh, and disaster risk, there is a, such a strong link um, that it cannot be ignored. Now, this, the um, theme of today's discussion is, of course, women in disaster risk reduction. Being in WMO, but not only here, it's also been a theme running through all the consultations for the Yoga Framework for Action 2, as we call it, it's the working name has been the issue of information, access, availability, free of charge, authoritative, who's the user, who's the consumer, who's the producer, how does it get used? And I think that's pretty much also the theme of the discussions that we are having today with this panelist. So I will let the um, discussions evolve around these themes. The panelists have been asked a little bit guiding questions, so you will hear that they will be uh, quite precise in their uh, presentations. The panelists will convey to you messages on what they think are very important in the context, and also try to, I think, express some wishes of what are their recommendations. But we would also need to hear from all of you. So the panel that we have today is um, um, a very competent panel. First of all, we have, of course, uh, President Tarja Halonen of Finland. Uh, Her Excellency the President not only was the first woman president of Finland, but today, after she's um, finished her office as president of Finland some years ago, um, is very engaged on sustainability issue. As a long list of engagement in different panels has been leading the high level panel for global sustainability 2010 to 12. Now you are a member of the leadership council of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Also on the high level panel on girls and women education for empowerment and gender equality. And um, you're a Drylands ambassador as well of yep. the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. What the list does not include is, of course, that you're also a champion and an ambassador for disaster risk reduction with particular regard to, to school safety. 
and chaired our high-level panel in the Global Platform in 2013. And many, many other things that are important to you, so you remain all too busy. Our second panelist is Ms. Zhao Meiyan, who is the Deputy Administrator of China Meteorological Authority. And I'd like to welcome you here. And uh, you, of course, you know, I, I was trying a rather cheap trick of saying that there are very few women in med services around the world, but I made that speech with China in the room who happened to have 40% senior women in the national med services, so I was speaking to the wrong, to the wrong constituency. <laughs> So I think uh, we, are, of course, are very proud of that one, but we will see what others were saying. I know you were just discussing how to motivate young women to join the Met Services to study metrology just before this session. So we look forward to hear from the audience more about that. Um, uh, Mr. Mubarak Mabuja is uh, from EGAD, uh, in an intergovernmental authority on development based in Djibouti, but of course for uh, Eastern Africa, the regional economic community. And you are the gender and development specialist in EGAD, so particularly well suited, of course, for, for this uh, panel. And then we have uh, to my left here, Ms. Uh, Beris Gwyn, who is, uh, you are the director and the representative to United Nations in Geneva of World Vision International. And uh, we also look forward to hear what you will contribute to this. So given the theme here, you know, I'd like to um, invite the panelists to really speak to you of what they have taken away from the leading questions and the theme of this. And they will do it quite succinctly, I'm sure. But they will also, I hope, uh, pose some challenges to you so that we can ask you for your guidance. And first of all, uh, of course, I'd like to invite uh, President Hallonen to share with us your perspectives. President Hallonen, please. And thank you very much. And, uh, we have met already today. So, so um, I, throw, I hope that I don't repeat the same things what, uh, what you heard already first thing in the mornings, and some of you perhaps even remember that. So um, I think that uh, one issue what I would like to underline is that when we speak about women, very often, and with the good reasons, we, we make them in a way, to, 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 we in a way say that they are victims, this and that, and they are fragile, and they are they are more vulnerable um, and, and helpless in the disaster situation. But this is only the half true. That's, uh, we can see in, in statistics uh, that unfortunately this is, this is true in such a way that, for example, disaster fatality rates are much higher for women than men. But we should then study why, because I would say that the women in many cases, most of the cases, they are very strong survivors if we give an opportunity, the chance for them to survive. So um, it's more that uh, it's the vulnerability to disaster risk is a result of the economic, social, and political inequality. So in, a, in a way, it's not the disaster itself. In very, very few cases, it can be so that certain risks are more dangerous for women, uh, especially for the pregnant women, and so on. But normally, it's, uh, disasters don't discriminate, but people do. And, and these disasters, in a way, they strengthen the, the unequal situation which has been already in the society. So um, that's one point. Then, so let's see our societies, which might be such kind of the features of our society, which might give an extra risk for women in such kind of the situations. Then the second is the women's role is also uh, quite often overlooked. Uh, so women do play a critical role uh, role in the disaster situation. They are those who are, who are uh, normally trying to rescue children and elderly people and household goods, managing evacuations, providing first aid and disseminating early warning messages if they receive them, if they receive them in a clear, informative uh, shape. So uh, uh, that's my second point. 
we have already the system by the meteorological institutes and, and the networking, how to do that. So the second point is that, so the early warning messages, uh, they are um, point, pointedly one aspect of, to be prepared and to responsibility with the strong gender dimension. And the warnings to, to, to reach women who in many countries are in the front lines of the climate change, this is an issue. Um, now, the women's role are different in different societies, but if the women are, for instance, at home when disaster happens, so we should know that how to reach by this information then. Um, so, mobile telephones or the radios and so on, you, you might, it might be needed to, to study the national or the local circumstances, which ways are the best for those people who are, who are uh, in the region. So it's not enough that you will, uh, you will get the message, the pre-warning message. Uh, women should also be trained and equipped for the early warning. So they are, of course, women are very smart, but they still need training for, for that situation that they could be as effective as, as possible. And um, I think you have during the day already discussed also that uh, in many developing countries, especially the women are farmers. And they should know not only those last minute warnings, but also the forecast for the longer period that they could be prepared at what will happen in, in, in agriculture. So uh, one thing what I always say to the scientists, um, when I said in Rio Plus 20 conference that the national economists who say that GDP is not enough, that it should be welfare. But it's the same with other scientists. They can be very, very useful. But let's release the scientists, that they can speak with all kind of people, not only the leaders, which is, of course, very important, but with all kind of the people. And so I think that, uh, that um, this kind of the, uh, weather information, what we a pre-warning system, what we are speaking about, is one specific area where we should discuss and, and develop the system which could be effective. And not only, as I said, that the information, but also that what to do in, in such kind of the case. And now, like it is in many other issues, and it is with the climate change, that those who are already in the most difficult situation, in the risky situation, they will be also met by the climate change and the extreme weather phenomena mostly. And so those countries are those who belong to these 80 countries which not yet have a good um, weather um, information system. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, so national meteorological services have a central role in information production for risk management, for agriculture, and also for socioeconomic development, policy, and climate change adoption. And um, so um, I will say that uh, that's the area where the money invested will give 10 times back. So that's really, again, a smart investment. And uh, real-time hydrometeorological data could help people to take life-saving action before a hurricane or the flood reaches their they home. So um, the point what I heard today when I was in Beijing plus 20 NGO meeting, uh, they had a long list of the, not hopes or wishes, but requests for the, for the conference which starts uh, tomorrow. Uh, so they say that they are lacking data. They should be much more exact data. I have already mentioned some data so that we, we, I can say that, for instance, in certain disasters, we can tell that which kind of the persons, women or men, elderly or young uh, boys or girls are, are suffered. But we, can, we could continue in this field much, much more so that it's not only the catastrophe itself. We should follow the situations one, two, three, five years later on, to see that how they have lived through this, this period. And um, so um, uh, that's why I say that uh, the, the next key point is the importance of the gender aggregated data to follow up and monitor the gender imbalances in DRR. And uh, 
Last but not least, I would say only that uh, concerning the investments in uh, uh, to build the infrastructure of the national meteorological services. So my small country, Finland, has been very active in this area, like I told already in the morning. And I, I always say that uh, it's, uh, it's worth of building. It's, uh, it, it gives uh, 10 times back for the countries who do it. And then I say also that the gender dimension has to be integrated into all these projects, what we have done. And this is also very smart investment. And uh, last but not least, the very last, I will say that I'm not so greedy concerning the new post everywhere to do this and that. But it's fantastic how, how big is the interconnection of, of all these things in the sustainable development. Wherever you start, with an economic crisis, social justice, or environmental issues, in all these three sectors, you see that we use only the half of the human capital what we have. You already guessed. The other half, which is not used so well, is the women's side. Now, in this meteorological side, I, I congratulate China that you have made a so good steps forward. But also, if we take the three sectors of the society, the governments, very important, then, and, and the good governance, then we take uh, the uh, NGOs, as I said, here in Geneva is a very big, uh, lively conference by NGOs in, in this sector. But then the third one, the business community. Already a long time ago in South Africa, we all agree that we need also the business community to be with us, the private sector. Some of them have been very good ones, some others not so good ones. Of course, it's good that we criticize those who are not so good ones, but we should also thank to make a positive profile for those who have been already the good boys or girls. And, and in that way, I would say that uh, to see also the sustainable development in such a way that the gender equality is needed in all these three actors also, and especially if we speak also about this area of the risk reduction. Thanks. Thank you. So I thank President Harlonen, um, particularly uh, several important points, but the business should not be missing in action. Uh, uh, they should really, and I know that they would like to be part of the action, but it's not always so easy to figure out how. So I think we all need to engage in, in figuring out how that can be done. Uh, so um, thank you. I'll uh, ask uh, Ms. Zhao Mei Yan of China. You have the floor, please. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm very honored to be here to participate in today's DRR discussion. Yes, that's okay. Okay, thank you. I'm very happy to be here today on this DRR discussion. As a member of the National Science and Science Service and the leader of the National Science Service, I'm very happy to be here today on this DRR discussion. 刚才主席女士和总统女士都提到了中国气象服务中的女性工作者的作用问题。我很高兴，我也想介绍一些情况。目前，在中国的气象部门的工作人员中，女性工作人员超过了百分之三十，其中。从事业务技术工作的人员超过了百分之四十。可以说呢，女性在中国的天气气候服务中，不仅扮演了重要的角色，而且呢，我们在气象服务中，也开始关注在减灾中性别的差异问题，以及呢。
采取相应的气象服务的对策。借此机会，我想与大家分享一下，中国的气象部门在提高农村女性防御气象灾害能力方面的一些实践经验和我们的一些观点。首先，我想要说，在中国，女性已经成为贫困地区灾害承受的主体。由于社会结构、文化传统等方面的差异，面对气象灾害，女性的脆弱性和受影响的风险更大。从这个。这张 PPT 图上，那我们 PPT 图上显示的可以看到，在中国呢，这个气象灾害与贫困区域的分布是非常相信、非常一致的。气象灾害多发区域与贫困区域啊，这个基本是吻合的。中国百分之九十五的绝对贫困人口生活在。生活这个生态环境极端脆弱的农村地区，近年来，中国城镇化速度发展很快，其中一个主要的特征就是，农村的青壮年男性大多进城务工，留守在农村的主要是妇女、儿童和老人。女性成为务农和照顾家庭的主要劳动力。目前呢，在中国的农村留守的妇女达到了五千万，占农村劳动力人口的百分之六十五到百分之七十。这意味着，在灾害来临时，农村妇女。既是主要的灾害承受者，也是应对灾害的主要的决策者。研究表明，社会结构和文化传统会带来两性的性别差异。面临灾害的时候，这种性别差异它的影响往往会被放大。与男性相比，女性面临的风险、脆弱性和压力更大。我们与联合国妇女署在中国中部农村就气象灾害与妇女问题开展的调查，发现了几个值得关注的现象。首先，农农村女性受教育程度要低于男性。在受教育水平仅为小学的受访者中，女性占到了百分之六十八。另外，由于占有的资源不同，在接受气象预警信息的方式方面，女性也与男性存在差异。女性通过手机和固定电话。获取气象预警信息的比例要低于男性。女性通过公共电子显示设设施和广播喇叭接受预警信息的比例呢，要高于男性。第三。由于社会角色的差异，女性和男性对气象服务的需求也是有明显差别的。男性呢更加关注宏观信息，体现了其社区和社会的取向；女性更加关注微观信息，体现了家庭和个体的取向。那么这些调查结果的意义就在于，它可以引导天气气候服务要关注性别的差异
我想在这里与大家交流的另一个，就是我们在气象服务实践中，如何来体现这样一种差异性。那么在中国呢，女性呢，既是受灾害影响的一个脆弱群体，是天气气候服务的重点对象，但是女性也是减灾中的一支有生力量，可以发挥有效的作用。那么我们在实践中的主要做法，第一就是增强妇女获取并应用天气和气候服务信息的能力，提高应对气象灾害的技能。比如，组织针对农村女性的气象灾害的培训、知识培训、培训教材和案例，也要求力求要简明易懂。符合农村女性的接受能力。第二呢，就是增加公共投入，在乡村建设公共电子显示屏和广播喇叭，来适应农村妇女信息接收的习惯。第三呢，就是动员女性。参与天气气候信息的传播。目前，我们已经在中国的广大农村发展了近七十万名的气象信息员，并动员妇女来参与。也有很多生动的事例表明，接受了培训的女性，这个女性气象信息员。在气象灾害预警信息的传播中，更加细心和负责任，为避免灾害损失也做出了积极的贡献。所以，从中国的气象服务实践，我们对女性在天气气候服务和减灾中的作用。有这样一些观点：一是要强化性别敏感度，提高性别意识。应该看到，尽管气象灾害影响的差异性以及女性在灾害影响中的脆弱性已经被认识到，但这种认知呢，并没有被广泛的关注和重视。因此。本次大会要呼吁强化防灾减灾的性别意识，提高全社会的关注度和认可度。国际社会也应采取必要的行动，推动将性别视觉纳入各个国家应对气候变化和防灾减灾战略和计划中，在公共政策制定和投资安排中。保障妇女在防灾减灾中的可持续发展。第二，国家水文气象部门在天气气候服务中，也需要体现社社会性别主流化，在制定战略规划以及天气气候信息和产品的制作和提供中，要考虑性别的差异需求，通过加强国家水文气象部门的。自身能力建设，开展有性别策略的、更具有针对性的天气气候服务。第三，灾害与贫困相伴相生，讨论女性在减灾中的作用，要更加关注贫困地区女性受灾害影响的脆弱性问题，加大力度帮助女性脱贫致富，并从。宽泛的视觉，考虑贫困地区女性提高防御灾害的能力问题，包括加强信息提供的能力建设，提高妇女的教育和培训水平，鼓励妇女主动参与防灾自救的能力。我们很高兴在这里与大家分享。我们的一些观点，并开展讨论。谢谢。
Thank you very much um, for sharing these perspectives from China and also with some very clear recommendation to MET services and to, I think, all of us who are working on different perspectives of sustainability. You also made the point of the very strong link between women's specific vulnerabilities and poverty, as women being the bearer of most poverty in many countries still. So. Um, I think probably we will hear a continuation of some of these um, perspectives from uh, Mr. Mubarak Mabuya when you represent East Africa. Uh, the floor, please. Thank you, uh, moderator and chair. All protocol is observed. My presentation will focus on um, a region um, that covers eight countries in the Horn of Africa, um, and that region, uh, we call it the IGAD region, with the Secretariat based in Djibouti, where I work as program manager for, for gender affairs. But first, to recognize that the existence of IGAD was a reaction to the frequent droughts that affected those eight countries in the Horn of Africa. And um, that our agenda today keeps um, on the agenda of ensuring that we address those diverse effects of um, of drought and other climatic shocks, among other challenges. The IGAD region is basically agricultural, but 70% of the region, which is about 5.2 million kilometers squared, is arid and semi-arid lands. With a population of about 230 million people, half of them women, and the agricultural labor force um, two-thirds of the agricultural labor force is provided by women. The characteristics of regi this region, again, you'll find that there is frequent food insecurity, rampant famine, hunger, starvation, poverty, and conflicts. This is the region that uh, is host to Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, Uganda, Ethiopia, Djibouti, Eritrea, and, 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 and Kenya. So the issue of uh, climate information is very, uh, climate information, weather and climate information services is very, very pertinent for this region. And this is why we have a center based in Nairobi called ICPAC. ICPAC is IGAD Center for Climate uh, Prediction and Applications. And it's based in um, Nairobi. And I'll be sharing with you what initiatives we have had to ensure that women can access information for seasonal planning, for in intra-season decision making, and also for livelihood diversification. The women in the region have their own way of predicting climate. Uh, it's not scientific. They usually tie it around events. For example, they would know in the past that around Easter, Rain usually coincided with Easter, so that would be time to plant. But unfortunately, things no longer work that way. Food security is no longer predictable. Pasture, pasture, 70% of the livestock in Africa is within this region I've just talked about. So pasture is very, very pertinent for the livelihoods, but it's also no longer predictable. Water is no longer predictable. Food security, no longer predictable. The good news is that Weather and climate is predictable, and that through specific interventions, we can make a difference in the lives of the 230 million people who live in this region. So in terms of our experience to access the population uh, with the information, we've had only one pilot project where we have been able to provide location-specific climate information, and this has been in Kenya, in four communities, um, four, 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 four villages. And uh, what we did was to be able to give not only information about how much uh, rainfall will be expected, but we also gave um, specific advice on which kind of crops to plant, when to plant them, um, issues to do with soil management, um, pasture, and so on and so forth, and, and the kind of options that they could take. But one of the things that we found on the ground as a barrier to accessing the information 
was that most of the information that was being given was delivered in a language that was not well understood. Many of these women do not have um, the kind of level of education that enables them to understand and use English, which is the common, commonly used language for dissemination of the information. And therefore, the technical terms that were used initially were not very helpful until we had to adjust and translate the terms into the local languages for purposes of ensuring accessibility. The communication channels were also not very uh, accessible by the women. Use of the radio, about 80% of the women rely on word of mouth as the source of information. The radios are owned by men, they buy the batteries, and this is in an area where, again, um, less than 20% of, of the whole nation has access to hydroelectricity power or any other form of renewable energy. So the issue of energy is quite important in enabling people to use radio. So the radio is controlled by the man because he has the money to buy the batteries. When he walks away, he switches it off. So if the message is through the radio, there is a challenge. Telephones, using SMSs, SMS so short message services, that is the other platform that we could use. But again, the price of um, airtime to, to be able to be on, connected and then also the energy to charge the mobile phone is another challenge that, that, that you find there. So what we did was to engage in community level dialogues where the scientists and experts would be together with the uh, community leaders, civil society, to be able to dialogue on this information that is exactly meant for them. It's not enough to say the rains will delay, they will come in insufficient quantities, but should be able to tell them what kind of crops can operate under those circumstances. And where you have um, even nutritional taboos, if you tell people eat sorghum, they may say that's not our kind of food. But climate change has to change the people's attitudes and mindsets about what they eat or not eat. They have to eat what the climate allows, allows them to grow. So we involve them in community dialogues to be able to uh, deal with um, these challenges. Community level meetings, again, one of the challenges you get is that the women suffer time poverty because of their traditional roles. Having them in meetings, you have to do double work. And particularly, the need to work with um, community, women in the community who are leaders and who have networks with these women. There are very few social networks that ha involve women, but where they are, where they are available, this prevent, provide a, an excellent opportunity to be able to reach out to the women with, uh, with this information. The impacts of disasters on women have been articulated since morning, but I want to um, just add a few footnotes to, to these impacts. Of course, aware that even the availability of sex disaggregated data of impacts is still a challenge. Most of the information we rely on is anecdotal. It's anecdotal evidence. And most of the responses uh, tend to just go to communities that are affected, mainly with relief. But um, what UNDP uh, 20, in 2010 was able to establish was that disasters lower uh, women's, um, more than men's life expectancy, and this is based on data from 141 countries collected between 1981 and 2001. And also that women are 14 times, women and children are 14 times more likely to die uh, during a disaster than men. But more importantly, quite often as part of the secondary effect of the disasters is that women face gender-based violence in terms of disasters. Where, for example, where there are uh, droughts or where there are, are floods and people are displaced or landslides, you'll find that women face um, gender-based violence and this is a gender-intensified vulnerability. In terms of what needs to be done or what could be done to address some of uh, these challenges. We need to develop strategies like we did through our pilot project that we had in Kenya to specifically target women, include them in um, uh, forums that we disseminate uh, weather and climate information. Once it is through the internet or through the radio or through another form of technology, at least anecdotal evidence will tell us that you will not have reached the women. So we need to look at strategies that take 
particularly in Africa and particularly in the Igad region, strategies that take information to the community. Currently, word of mouth is word of mouth is the is, is the uh, commonest form of information dissemination to the women. But how do we do it? It's quite expensive. We need to think about that because if we don't, the costs of the effects are much more than what we invest in ensuring that the message reaches the women. We need to also recognize the women's contribution to disaster risk reduction. A lot of inferences have been made at this meeting, uh, for example, tapping the indigenous knowledge of women. The men run away and you wonder what the masculinity, we, we tell, when we do gender we are told that masculinity is about resilience, it's about being able to withstand shocks. But in the face of climate change, we've seen that actually the men run away. And through our case study, the women in uh, uh, Oloi Tok Tok in Kenya told us that before our intervention, before assisting them to use climate information to better manage their livelihood activities, whenever there was drought, the men moved to the cities, they moved to Kisumu and other areas. But after giving them information and they were able to grow food, the men stuck at home. They stopped moving around and started assisting them. So this also makes a good case for um, stabilizing families. And even the violence in the homes did reduce um, in, the, in, in, in that context. So we need to document um, this um, knowledge that the women have used. Because they cannot leave the children in the household alone and they can't move them to the city, they are forced to stay at home and ensure that they provide food for them. We need to create gender awareness at the community level. Giving the women information alone is not enough. The assets, livelihood assets that are required to build resilience are often controlled by men. Indeed, in most of the communities, men look at women as a form of property. They look at them as a form of resilience mechanism. They look at them as a form of labor. So we need to, we need to address this challenge by creating gender awareness at the community level ensuring that we reform uh, property rights, ensuring that we protect women's pro property rights, ensuring that there is equitable access and utilization of livelihood assets and resources, because these are critical for building resilience. And for us at IGAD, this is one of the things that we are doing through our Drought Disaster Resilience and Sustainability Initiative, an initiative that has been endorsed by heads of state and an initiative that we are working on rigorously to ensure that we make a difference. I want to end here and we'll be able to uh, respond to specific uh, questions and comments. But what we want to say is that information that does not reach the women, particularly in my region, will not make a difference in terms of addressing the impacts of droughts or the impacts of climate change. I thank you. Thank you, Mubarak. Um, very, very strong message from you on East Africa, and uh, not only the challenges and problems, but also how to look at these issues to make progress. So thank you for that. And we'll move to the final speaker before we can open the floor, Beris Gwyn from uh, World Vision International. Um, and I know you also bring a very practical perspective for our continued discussion, please. Thank you very much. World Vision is one of the largest international NGOs. We work in 100 countries around the world, and we've been very much involved in the discussions around disaster risk reduction. As a relief, development, and advocacy organization, we are concerned as much about prevention and mitigation as we are about response. And so any chance to talk about DRR particularly as it relates to food and water security, to the competition for shared resources, and the inevitable conflict and violence that, that follows. Uh, we were very pleased to have had the opportunity to join this panel today in such distinguished company. In terms of gender access to weather and climate services, in some ways for me it's disappointing that we should need to have an event on this subject. When it is self-evident 
that women should be a significant part of our strategy globally. It's obvious that awareness of weather and climate information increases resilience in terms of risk assessment and early warning and preparedness. It's obvious that inclusion is important, uh, not only, as we've heard, because women bear a disproportionate burden in terms of the costs in life and in, in the roles that they play, but because women are typically the carers, the providers of, and guardians of good health, the providers of education, they're entrepreneurs, but most importantly, I would emphasize that in their roles, they are the guardians of the next generation. And so if we are to break this cycle, we have to find ways for young people, for children and young people, to be also exposed to DRR techniques that they will be able to apply themselves. But finally, I'd like to say that it's almost offensive that we have to justify why women should receive this attention. When after all, they constitute a half of the world's population. We and, do. And uh, we do, and are entitled also to the full range of human rights. The involvement of women ensures that there is a, an adequate contextualization based on the whole story, not just on part of the story. And to quote from a recent ODI report, that means not just taking the recipe and adding a dash of women and girls, but it means reconceptualizing how we approach some of these issues. Women are also great mobilizers. And so in response, it's often the women who are seen there alongside men and, and with their families to respond to these sorts of situations. So if we take as a given that women should be more a focus for attention, let me just mention a couple of the challenges that we see as World Vision, which in their own way generate opportunities for us to shift the game, uh, to avoid there being a repetition of more promises made and broken, and an, a failure to respond to the increasing urgency for scalable action to prevent what we see coming this century. First, it's quite clear that inclusive approaches add value, and by that I mean men and women, boys and girls. World Vision focuses particularly on children and young people, but I also feel obliged to say that in many communities it is what I hate to say are called elderly people, and the definition seems to be anyone over 65, uh, that elderly people often are the mainstay, and typically women, the elderly people in these communities. But we need sustained investment in these processes, purposeful involvement of these otherwise marginalized audiences, and we have to be blunt in addressing power, privilege, and preferences. We need a much more sophisticated understanding of those issues. In inclusive approaches also, as has been said already, World Vision feels passionately about the need for facilitated multi-stakeholder partnerships involving government and private sector, as well as academic and professional partners and other NGOs. But we insert the word facilitated because our feeling is that there has been too much naivety around how complex these are, important but complex, and they need dedicated, skill, skilled people to take them forward. My second point is in challenges and opportunities that we struggle, I know, with complexity. But there is a danger, I think, with the degree of specialization that we have lost the capacity to see holistically the challenges that confront us. So I'm, I'm delighted to see that we've moved from post-2015 and MDGs to be looking at sustainable development goals. But I do think we also have to remind ourselves that these don't, don't take place in a vacuum either, and we need to link to causes of conflict globally, we also need to link to uh, local and global issues, urbanization, small and large. There's a tendency perhaps for the larger to dominate. But let me on this point conclude by saying importantly, to deal with this kind of complexity, it's our view that we need a different set of tools, that the old way of analyzing are not adequate, that an incremental change is not going to be acceptable, that we need to find new analytical frameworks 
and new tests to assure that the equity and public purpose is served directly rather than as a further trickle-down process. On data management, there are many people in this audience who would know better than I the work that's being done already by CGIAR, by others, around what it means to have gender-sensitive and gender-responsive data access. But I would just want to mention that we're very much interested to see the Global Framework for Climate Services rolled forward in a timely way, bringing together the various stakeholders that we've mentioned before. NGOs have a lot to, tribute, to contribute in this space, and I'm glad to say that we've begun to work much more in coalitions, so we are able and ready to offer a scalable response to participate in these processes. There's a heightened demand, my next point, for public, that is transparent, community-driven accountability. Too often in the past, commitments have been made without there being adequate governance processes in place so that our respective leaders and ourselves can be held to account to deliver on the offers that have been made. And finally, and I think most exciting of all, we believe that there, we, although at a critical point in history, we are facing real potential in terms of new sources of funding and resource mobilization. Let me just say to start that I wish it were possible for the global development system to count the contributions of developing, so-called developing countries. Because we live still in this paradigm of north-south, recipient beneficiary, first world, third world, we need to throw that language out and acknowledge the contributions of communities and countries all over the world uh, in this effort. I think we should deplore the diminishing levels of official development assistance, but we all know that that's not the answer. We also should recognize that civil society organizations are facing increasing pressure, including in some of the countries that are most fragile, having their space to maneuver and to give voice to their opinions reduced. But the exciting possibilities for me are in terms of private sector engagement. And if I could say there what World Vision is asking is for corporate social responsibility. But in that regard, we say it's not how much you give, it's how you made it. We want responsible corporate behavior. Secondly, we look to the example set by India, which has legislated that companies have to pay a percentage of profits for public purpose activities. But in addition to this corporate social responsibility agenda, there is now a raft of development bonds, impact investors, new business models, which will require all of us to scale up our responses and, importantly, to leave egos and logos at the door. The time is much too urgent for us to be precious about who gets to be first and who gets to be biggest. And certainly, World Vision is ready for this challenge. Increasing women's role in disaster risk reduction through access to improved weather and climate services will undeniably yield disproportional benefit. How we cannot grasp this challenge is quite beyond me. It is a mission possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beres. I think you came back to the point we need to see the whole story, not just the salt that you sprinkle on top of the plan that you've already made. Um, I think both of you had the same message very strongly. Um, but also a number of complex issues around process, and I think what we are all faced with now, and this is, I'm sure, going to be a lot of the discussions on 2015, is commitment without process attached to them for how to achieve them. So there has, this has been a very rich, I'm not going to try to summarize it. I instead give the floor to all of you to um, add to it. Please ask questions to the panelists on specifics that they may have offered you. And um, as you have questions and challenges, I hope, I will eventually draw it to a close and give the panelists a chance to say what their one recommendation and takeaway from the discussion will be. 
So please let me know if you would like to ask a question, a comment. Since I don't know who you are, please, in well, I know who you are, Amanda, but I don't know everyone, so please introduce yourself. So, um, Amanda, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much for a wonderful panel, very ably chaired, and uh, thank you to all the panelists for their excellent presentations. I love Mission Possible. I want to adopt that one. And I think, too, the fact that interventions that do not reach women will not make a difference. I think those are two very strong messages, so thank you for, for making those points compellingly. I wanted also to pick up on comments from our representatives from both China and Finland and finish with a question. You talked about the importance of long-term investment, and when we do the numbers, we really can see that it pays off to be making sure that we are planning for disasters and disaster proofing. And I think from my own country, being from New Zealand, which experienced a very serious earthquake of around the same magnitude as Haiti, and yet because we had more rigorous standards, we had 185 deaths versus a couple of hundred thousand, and obviously tragedy in both countries, but because there had been stricter rules in New Zealand, there was not the same death toll. So my first question is, how do we actually get the private sector to implement standards, and how do we make sure that the right kinds of public policy frameworks are being set as we are debating this post-2015 development agenda, particularly as we know that there are increased extreme climate events? Uh, the second question was really to ask how you think countries who are doing a lot domestically on integrating the gender dimension into disaster risk planning and management might be able to share some of those experiences, particularly those who are donors and who can perhaps reach out and help developing country partners to do that. And I know some of the work that's been done in the Pacific, we formerly had the Samoan minister here earlier, uh, has tried to do that through the Na National Disaster Management Offices. So I think that's one uh, interesting model and would be interested in in further models. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'll take a few questions and then we'll turn to the panel. Please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My question, before that, I want to totally agree with the last speaker, no, before the last, but one, but one speaker that said, um, given all that we've had today, there is need to have a new business model and that implies that we should all scale up our responses. Now, my question is to the gentleman from EGAD. Yes, I would like to know, having established the fact that we can predict climate change and vulnerability, and the problem is now that we cannot predict food, security, food insecurity and all the other associated hazards. And perhaps what I want to suggest is that there should be a linkage between the service providers and the vulnerable group, even if it means going through the NGO, so that they can get this information. Since climate and weather are predictable, then if they are given the advisories, you know, uh, with a good lead time, then it could reduce the impact. Then secondly, I also want to touch on the issue of violence. Um, I, ca I can see that earlier session mentioned the fact that this conference is very, very much timely. Um, 25th of November is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, and 10th of December is Human Rights Day. So we have these 16 days of activism you know, against gender-based violence. My question is, what are we doing since um, Mr. Mubarak has already identified that there are some, there are some climate based, climate related violences like droughts and everything. Is it possible to incorporate that into our information so that women can also be empowered to know how to handle these violences that are climate related? Thank you very much. Thank you. There are some challenging questions there. We'll see if there are a couple or more why the panelists think about 
the answers they can offer. You have the floor, sir. Sorry. Uh, Thank you, Chair, and I also want to join my colleague to thank the panelists. I think they did an excellent job. I am the Ambassador of Kenya, so I wanted to, I think from the discussion, what came across is, uh, and is missing maybe in the presentation, but I know I missed the earlier part in the morning, is uh, the role of media in disaster. Uh, I find that one of the, com I think the, the late, before we went for lunch, how we can be able to strengthen our journalists, especially on the science part, to be able to cover disaster and the climate change related issues so that they, they are objective I feel when you look at the coverage, especially disaster in Africa, what one sees, you see this graphic aftermath images. And these images are routinely accompanied by warning that they, are, they may be disturbing to viewers. So I feel that really journalism, especially the science, which is very weak, so before we finished, I personally, a recommendation I could make uh, during the discussions before the main meeting is that how do we really empower our women journalists? How do we en encourage women to do journalism, especially the science part? And if you see most of our papers, it's sensational. If you look at anything covered either on uh, science I look at our uh, papers, if there is anything is at the back, and the very little. So that will help really in this war or how to implement the disaster to mainstream it. Uh, the journalists have done very good work, but most of them are overseas, CNN, etc. The local journalism, but build the science, especially in schools, because we were talking before lunch how do we build scientists, women scientists, girls, to provide scholarships to entice them to do the science, especially meteorology. Uh, that is uh, what I feel that it will also help, like uh, what my compatriot here from IGAD uh, was saying is that uh, the women are limited, they are marginalized, information is uh, by word of mouth. So we want to be able to make everything scientific. We really want, if we have women journalists covering some of these issues, they will be more objective. But other people have other interests, but we would like to see women to cover the, uh, really the instances or what is happening whenever there is, there is, I mean, uh, there is a disaster, that there is objectivity that you only cover the worst part and you are not giving the other side that there are progress being made and these are the challenges, I said. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. That's certainly yeah. a frustration that disaster has such a short span in media, six months and the train goes away. I think uh, President Talonen also mentioned that. So with that is certainly a practical proposal we have one speaker down there in the last row. Your mic is alive, yes. Yes, hello. My name is uh, Babette Resurrection from the Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, first of all, thank you for the very excellent presentations of everybody in the panel. I'd like to address my question to our colleague from East Africa. Um, you mentioned that, uh, as I, if I understood correctly, that resilience is masculine and that women are often used for purposes of increasing resilience. I find that a very uh, counterintuitive point and a compelling point, and I would uh, like to request you to please uh, elaborate on this a little bit and bring it more forward. Thank you. 
So one more before we leave the panel is a chance to react. You have the floor. Yes, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, Makara from Zimbabwe. Uh, very much, uh, I want to concur that this, uh, this, this has been a very good session. Congratulations. Now, my question is to the uh, Deputy Administrator of the China Meteorological Administration. I was particularly impressed when she mentioned that uh, in China they are recruiting women uh, volunteers to disseminate weather and climate information. I think that is really very, very important. We are trying to do the same thing in Zimbabwe, so I would like to know from her how she is doing it. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, how China is doing it. Thank you. Good, and I, please, you also get the chance now. Yes, please. After that finish. No. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I first of all congratulate the panelists for their laudable um, dis discussions during the past few minutes. My question goes to the man from IGAT. I would like to know the percentage of women that um, listen to their advices and stick to the planting dates or type crop types to see how accurate the accuracy of the focus. Thank you. Thank you. So on the panel, you all have some very concrete questions. I'll start with you, Mubarak, because you have some interesting. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, um, uh, Chair, and the participants for uh, the very uh, good questions. Um, basically, it, it, it means that uh, the, the message was well received and that there's interest in the region where I work and the people whom I serve. The first question was um, um, about how we are able to predict um, climate and, and, and why I did say that uh, food security and other uh, phenomena are not predictable. Uh, for clarity, um, my message is that the communities that we serve use traditional or have been using traditional methods of predicting. For example, if it's rain, they know rain comes around Easter, then they plant. And today, when you go to many of the communities uh, in East and Horn of Africa, you'll get complaints. We planted, but the seeds did not germinate. We planted, but there was El Nino, and we lost our crops, and so on and so forth. So that makes food security uh, a big challenge. Um, and even in areas that are arable, you'd still find food um, insecurity in some of these areas because of climate change. Um, in terms of prediction, there are where we have reached with science. Scientists are able to predict, and actually, with even our own IGAD climate um, applications, climate prediction and application center in Nairobi, we've been able to establish that between 1960 and um, and uh, 2012, the amount of rainfall reduces by 150 millimeters every 50 years. Uh, this is a region that receives currently less than 600 millimeters of rainfall every year. So with science, it's something that we are able to predict. But the issue is that this knowledge needs to move from scientists to go to the level of the, of the, of the farmers who need it. And many of these, two-thirds of the farmers in this region are women, but they don't access this information. And we need, if we are to make a difference, to ensure that this information reaches the women. The second question was about gender-based violence and the 16 days of activism that are commemorated between 25th of November and 10th of December, and uh, what we are doing about this. Um, any um, discourse around gender-based violence, particularly when you do analysis, uh, you'll see that uh, disasters Disasters like um, floods, landslides, or drought are contributing factors. The primary or the, the root cause is uh, gender inequality and equal power relations. But there are so many contributing factors, and one of them is that of these disasters. Much as war contributes, um, floods can contribute to, 
to 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 instances of for example rape when people are displaced so it's a contributing factor and ideally the campaign since every year has a theme maybe we should work with UN women and other partners to ensure that at least we have a specific theme that uh, discusses uh, issues of gender based violence in the context of 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 climate change and then the attendant disasters that would be an interesting uh, theme for uh, a 16 day campaign i hope the colleagues and partners in UN women are taking that message seriously as well as well as civil society who are deeply interested and involved in in um, uh, the 16 day campaign and the 365 day of action i think it should not only be a campaign of 16 days but i think it should translate into 365 days of action on these very issues um, I will talk about the, um, the the final question. I'll leave the the, the role of the media to the colleagues. Um, resilience. Uh, I made a mention that in my context, um, resilience is a masculine identity, um, and this goes to the whole idea of how are we socialized, uh, where I come from, men are socialized to withstand hardships. Uh, even when you are beaten, you're not supposed to cry. And when you cry and you're a man, they say you cry like a woman, as if men don't have tear glands. So in that way, the men are taught to be brave, to be hard, to withstand shocks. That's why they join the armies to fight and so on. But they run away from hunger. And that was the question. It, it, is, not, it is not to say that it is good to say resilience is a masculine identity. But I, the message is, and this is the message that we've given to our partners, which is a multi-sectoral multi um, and the multi-country strategy, the IGAD disaster, drought disaster resilience and sustainability initiative. We call it IDRISI, and it's available online. What we are telling partners is that if we do not integrate a gender perspective at the level of implementation. Classically, gender mainstreaming has seen its way and space in documents at the macro level. It fades as you go down into implementation. So what we are trying to do and what we are, want to ensure that we do by 2027 is that the different actors in implementing this strategy endorsed by heads of state and government in the IGAD region, that the implementers ensure that there is equitable participation of women and men in all the resilience building strategies. There are seven pillars, be it in agriculture and natural resource management, be it in disaster risk reduction, be it in peace and security, be it in knowledge management and so on and so forth. That or livelihood support, social services, those are the broad areas of intervention, it's multi sectoral. That agenda um, all interventions must be based on gender analysis and that the responses should be able to ensure that women and men equitably participate and benefit. So yes, the, the, the social assumption is that resilience is for men, but the reality in the face of disasters is that women are the ones who have shown uh, this resilience and that any resilience uh, strategy needs to tap into this knowledge that uh, the, the knowledge that women have used and um, use that for purposes of building on that to make a difference. I hope that clarifies on the issue of, um, of, of resilience and masculinity. Thank you. Thank you. For the next round, I'm not sure we will have time for it, but, but I will ask you to reflect on um, how do we consider the necessary information for all these men that go away to the urban areas? You mentioned it, and I think it was the same thing in China. They also need to be right seen question. as targets of information for managing their productivity. So let's keep that in mind and not forget about it. Can I turn? To So I'm not at all the expert on that. In, in Finland, Finland it's, it's a normal tradition that uh, women become, girls and, and women become more educated and they, they move to the cities. 
and boys are school droppers and, and the men are staying in the countryside. <laughs> so, so I'm not expert in this Chinese issue, but I think that in both cases we should find the ways how, how to keep the people in, in education and then to create an education, how, how to get a job for them. This is at least the problem with us. Um, I, I, I would rather come back to this uh, private-public system later on, if you can give the floor for those who know better about the Chinese situation. Okay. This is my Okay. And, and any comment you want to make to the questions you were asked also about the messengers? Okay. Uh, okay. 我首先想先回答主席女士刚才谈到的关于城镇化以后男人逃到城市里天气气候服务中来对他们提供气象服务所以目前我们在整个中国的广大农村使这些信息源怎么样让更多的群体他接收信息的能力就更弱我们也向一些在非洲国家的一些非洲的一些国家提供气象监测和气象预警的设施也是根据这些国家的一些需求这样帮助这样一些国家能够提升他们气象信息的接收能力这是我们的一些经验和体会谢谢so um, I would, um, I would uh, like to continue about this uh, private-public cooperation. I said myself that uh, we need also the business community. But then if I come back to that, uh, what's the system, what I see that 
is the most useful to build on is the public system. I mean that the National Meteorological Institute is a good networking system. And I think that the question is that uh, uh, with that, I see that we have the best possibilities to get a transparent uh, system and to access to information. But uh, why I also ask the, the, the cooperation with, uh, with the business uh, community is that in many cases when we have to react in, in, uh, in disasters or e even in, uh, in a prevailing situation, so we need this cooperation. Uh, but concerning the public, the public sector, of course, if we speak it very, very openly, one, one issue is a corruption. I normally, I, I deny to say that it's corruption. I, it's, I say that it's stealing from the state or the community, because I think that good governance, transparent system is, is, is the basic. You have to have a basic confidence that when you have this system that nobody takes it between the system, so that that when, wherever you, you um, raise funds from the NGOs or the private or public sector, that the money which could be used to this, uh, this situation is really used in transparent and fair way. But it's another way around also, that if we only build in the private system, so you know all these difficulties that who has the property rights in this and that in the material side. And in that way, I think that the large enough the public sector is, is the good guarantee that really we can, we can get such kind of the society of the information. Mm -hmm. So I'm not um, able to answer how you do it in, 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 in details, uh, details, but I think that what the New Zealand <laughs> colleagues have asked to take an example, that if you have the sound, strong, basic system in your society, so that works also best in the, in the um, uh, risk situation. So if you know that the health or the social help services or education is working normally well, so it will work also much better in the catastrophic situations. The second point is, of course, that uh, um, also such kind of the sectors, which are private ones, can be also the public, but very often private, like the building the housing or the schools and so on. They should be the transparent system so that you, you really know that the houses are strong enough and the how that the schools are prepared in in certain way and so and, and again you can have a good cooperation with private and public but the transparency is the word you have to know that it really has happened that when you have the earthquake that you you don't see that wow they were the schools who were broken down it's not a question of the government it's a question of the good governance and a good transparent cooperation with the private sector and um, so the last, uh, last but, uh, but uh, not least question is the media. Uh, I, uh, it, it could be always useful to have also the media discussion because I know which kind of the presser uh, the media people are working, that you have to find something which goes in three minutes to, as the first primary. And, and so normally such kind of the issues what we are discussing, they are more, more in the documentary side. How you save the lives is not in, in such a way a piece of news that how many have been died. And I mean that it's, it's more, it's broader issue that what's a piece of news today. But um, I do think so that it would be really worth of, uh, having a good cooperation with the good media and telling on, not only what will happen beforehand, but also to, to follow the words and not to make a scandal so much, but to real transparency could be some piece of the information they could give it and, and to work with that. So um, I think that you have made um, wonderful papers here in, in, in this conference. So I have read them true when I came here by, by the flight. And, and I think so that if uh, the part of this will be uh, implemented, so we will be much, much better position. So you have done a good work already. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Beres, some comments from you to some of the things you felt touched on what you said. Thank you very much. I'm conscious that time is running out, so I'll be brief and assure anyone who wants to follow up um, 
I'd love to be able to take these conversations forward. The first thing I wanted to say was that as we look at multi-stakeholder partnering, we're working from the premise that we are all first citizens. It doesn't matter where you work. And the bifurcation or trifurcation between private sector, civil society and government is a nonsense. We have to move past that. We are citizens first. Secondly, I think we are facing a Westphalian shift, those of you who've done government and politics. The system of all decisions made by national governments was created in the 1600s. Global governance has moved in ways where citizens need to re-engage, sometimes and most often through parliaments, sometimes through local governments, if we keep in mind that in a very short period of time, five of the nine billion will be living in cities. And so we have a shifting sand here around governance arrangements, whereas citizens we need to have active participation. Secondly, in terms of the global political economy, we're working on a framework that will take us from what we see as a very selfish economy. What's in it for me? How can I maximize my profit? Past a solidarity economy or past, past a circular economy where we're trying to get more sustainable economic practices, past a solidarity economy which is about aid and charity, into an economy where we take seriously the values and beliefs and ethics that we each of us bring to these conversations. So it's a relational economy. We are, have only one world and we are all on this planet together. So I would have liked to have spoken a little to the, to the media because again, just as government is changing or governance, just as economy is changing, so the role of the media. And I despair sometimes at the quality of reporting in the traditional media because it seems that they play to the lowest common denominator. Fortunately, we've seen things go viral that represent a new way of communicating and young people are on top of this way of communicating. So I think we have opportunities there that will open up for us uh, in, in new and exciting ways. Very last thing for me to say is I also think, coming back to the questions of accountability, that there are now models created either by these new uh, coalitions that are emerging or the UN Secretary General himself set up the Information and Accountability Commission to monitor commitments to the Every Woman, Every Child campaign. Mm -hmm. I think we collectively have the mechanisms available to make sure that this set of promises stick. Um, so I think uh, our WMO organizers are quite anxious that we should close this panel. <laughs> so in respect for seeing them hovering around a bit, I will not do a, an extremely long summary, but I think I've heard from this panel a few things in addition to their very concrete recommendation. One, uh, I think um, uh, our colleague, the deputy administrator from China, in fact, talked about DRR as a public good. This is a very important statement, so keep it with you. Um, I think the, you know, I have heard, not here, but accountability is not just uh, something to, for governments to live up to, but it's also for all of us, no matter in what function we participate. It's something we have to hold ourselves to, but more intensely than from most other communities I have heard over the past year, a strong call by civil servants and government technicians that they want better accountability systems within their own governments. Because it's not easy to figure out what is precisely your responsibility and your function, because the governance structures themselves are not today very appropriate for the problems that have to be solved. And this is a global issue. We have it in the international institutions, but governments and we share the same challenges unless we've had the opportunity to reconfigure ourselves, and that is not done in one year. Um, and, and to get to uh, gender and women, I think this panel should agree that it shouldn't be a question about if or why, 
but it's something, it's a starting, uh, a starting uh, position that obviously um, not minimize the, the use we make of all the available human resources to tackle both the opportunities and challenges. But having said that, I think from the perspective of the Chinese Met Services that this is a responsibility also of the Met Services to understand the audiences that they communicate with and understand how they receive the messages and what it means. That's why I brought in this issue of urban communities as well, because they are as dependent on weather as any rural community for their functionality. And also to understand much better how much we can achieve. I think this was very clear from Mubarak. There is so much to achieve by a much clearer uh, targeting in the work we do. I don't think overall, maybe I'm unfair to some of you, but overall I think sometimes we are a little bit vague on our targeting and therefore good intentions, in fact, not reaching the groups that we believe who we are trying to work in favor of. So that is probably a strong recommendation from this group, if I may take the freedom to interpret what you've said. Some very good examples, I mean, your um, uh, Mubarak, also your analysis of the barriers. You know, it's easy to assume that all the modern means of communication, technology, even getting cheaper, it's part of sort of our own uh, life illusion that the cell phone now is so cheap that everyone can have it. That is probably true. But the chip costs money, the battery must be charged, etc. There are social uh, tension within families and groups on who's in charge of the cell phone. So I think we need to be a bit more careful before we make assumptions of how quickly information, in fact, do travel, and if it hits the target that it's intended to hit. Um, now, um, there has been very practical suggestions here. They are on record now, the weather messengers. Mobilizing young women uh, and boys, your point, uh, to become meteorologists, but also to become journalists. I mean, responsible journalism is probably one of the most valuable assets we all have. Why is journalism the way it is? Well, it's because of market demands. We are not ready to pay for the type of journalism that we would like to have. So it's not that it's necessarily somebody else's fault. It's going with market demands. And there are some good examples. I know of some. So I also want to defend some journalists, uh, really. Um, and then um, looking at the positive side of things, uh, women, yes, have special vulnerabilities, but let's let's also get very used to look at women as the main re as resources. Mobilizers, providers, first responders, professionals, best academic records in most countries in the world today. Let's, let's move with the change of time to also see how you know, women who are self-conscious and, and take pride in what they do, wherever it is in the community, how they can be not only gain power, but also get more confidence, uh, including in very complicated situations. And I think um, your 16-day uh, uh, campaign should be so turned into a 365-day campaign. I think it's really the message to take away from here, be it on gender-based violence or any other things, we cannot minimize our influence to have a good panel, and I'd like to thank all the panelists here for their contribution. We've taken careful note of what you're saying. Um, I, if you agree on the messages that I try to summarize there, these can be our main messages to the outcome of the conference. Yes? It's okay? It's okay. Did I miss anything important from you, Mubarak? <laughs> In that case, I'd like to close the panel and thank President Halonen, uh, Mubarak, Ms. Jiao, and uh, uh, Beris very much for their contribution and for your contribution as well. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much again to our high-level panelists. Just for all of our participants today, it's been a long day, I know, but hang with us. We have one more working session. This is your chance as you are all experts who've come to this today. The next two working sessions are going to be about, we have panelists who will talk, but it's mostly audience participation. So please, we'd like about half of you to head downstairs. If you go out these doors, there is a circular staircase that takes you down to room C1. Can, uh, I don't know if I can get the slide up again that shows the two names, but in this cell we are going to have working session 1A on education and capacity building. And we have a great panelist for you. Downstairs in C1, we will have a session on risk and DRR communication. So we're going to take as quick a break as possible, wrap this up, and then we will go, we'll have the reception tonight. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Yes, you, you I are. Can, you can hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you please uh, take your seats so we can start the session? Uh, we would really appreciate it if you can cluster together. This is a working session, so we will need to work, have you work. Uh, it's going to be a different format from uh, the plenaries that you had so far. Up to now you have been just listening. Now it's about time that you come and contribute with your knowledge on the outcomes of this meeting. So please cluster together as we're going to request from you to work together pretty soon. So as you enter, cluster together. We do not want to have one person here, another person there. You can be whatever you want to be so long as you're in clusters. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alexandros Makarigakis. I am the chief of the Disaster Risk Reduction Unit in uh, UNESCO. And uh, I have the pleasure and the honor to uh, moderate uh, this uh, first working session, uh, which has to do with uh, education capacity building uh, and gender issues within uh, disaster risk reduction. I have a, a great panel. Uh, loaded of uh, esteemed colleagues, and uh, I'm going to be introducing one by one to you. Uh, as I said, this is a working session, so the format will be the following. We're going to have our panelists giving us their experience, and afterwards we're going to turn in to you to give us your experience on the issues. And that's why we're going to ask you to work in groups groups of six to eight people maximum, and you afterwards gonna decide who will be that person who will come and present the work of the group. So it's a working session, again. It's not just a plenary. Uh, unfortunately, one of our panelists, uh, who thankfully will be also our first speaker, has to leave soon. And that's why the format that we're going to use also will be having the panelist uh, give us her experience and then allowing from the, play, uh, from the audience uh, a question. And then we're going to move to the next speaker until we finish with our panelists here, and then you're going to be going at work. Our colleagues from WMO are distributing right now to you three documents. One of the documents has the questions that actually our panelists will be responding to and will giving their own experience in this area. The second one is just the form that we actually want you to complete when you do your work in the group and that your, the representative of the group will come up here and present. It's a recommendation that we're asking from all of you. And then the final is an input from uh, one of our colleagues uh, who has prepared some uh, uh, handouts for you. So without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our first panelist, uh, who is none other but uh, Lorena Aguilar. If you were uh, earlier here during the lunch break, uh, Lorena also gave a presentation uh, at the lunch forum on Beijing Plus 20. Uh, Lorena is the Global Senior Advi Gender Advisor at IUCN. She has more than 30 years of experience in initiatives involving public policy development, building local institutions, and the incorporation of social and gender issues into development. So Lorena, uh, could you please uh, let us know, based on your experience, how could we improve the integration of gender into policy guidelines and disaster reduction? And how can we get women to, inc uh, women to, to have a, a more uh, active role in disaster awareness and preparedness programs, to get involved in capacity building uh, and mainstreaming their inclusion into policies, uh, into strategies, etc.? Uh, thank you very much, Alex. And 
I am a storyteller, so I'm going to tell you a story of how we have done it when it comes uh, to policy implementation and also being able to engage women in this process of policies. And it's the story of how we did it uh, in relation to climate change and policy uh, processes that involves um, DRR. So in 2007, um, we found out, as some of you have heard, that there was no mention of um, gender issues in the debate of climate change and disaster uh, risk reduction at that level of the climate change uh, convention. And the first thing that we found out is that there was no knowledge to understand the linkages. So we start building that knowledge for one and only purpose that was updating the decision makers on the linkages between gender and uh, the importance for climate change and um, DRR. Why did we invest it in this? Because the parties themselves are the one that have to give a mandate to develop policy. But if they don't understand what the linkages are, they're not going to see the value of it. So for us, the first part that is fundamental in this process of policy is making the case. Why is gender so important for disaster risk reduction, for the climate change uh, agenda? And we always say that we update a minister. You never train them. So we conducted these updating sessions in which we make uh, the case. And then the other very important thing in this process is that these decision makers were the ones that ask for the policies. We could not impose them. You have to do them. No. Once they understood the value, the second part that was so important for us was them asking to develop these processes. Now, when we went to the national level, already with the government saying, we want you to support us to do this, we found out the different groups that needed to be involved in the process of developing the policies, because we think that these processes have to be multi-stakeholder uh, groups. It cannot be a consultant sitting in a room writing a policy for a government. It really had to bring together the different groups. The different voices did not have the same knowledge on the topic either. For example, when we sat with women groups and we tried to discuss with them um, words like IPCC and RED and DRR, they didn't know what we were talking about. So if we put them together with people that are very knowledgeable on disaster risk reduction and on climate change, without building that capacity before, their participation was not meaningful at all. So we learned that you, leave, you need to like lever the field in order to uh, bring those different voices. And then the process of building the policy started. And everybody bringing their own opinions from their own position, understanding what the other were saying. And then we um, ended up with uh, very nice uh, national policies that deal with gender uh, and climate change. They were later on formalized by the governments, either by the ministers or the presidents uh, that did uh, those processes. But I think also one of the things of these policies is that um, we have what we call the right eyes, like eyes, like in inclusive. They had to be inclusive. They have to represent the different groups of stakeholders in this process. They had to improve the quality of life of women and men. They had to increase sustainability. But they have to talk about innovation. We cannot keep addressing gender and DRR only by seeing women the vulnerable or the girls the vulnerable. It to, they, they have to talk about innovation. For example, one of the policies that ended up in a plan of action in Liberia is women taking care of the meteorological station throughout the coast of Liberia and sending the information to the Ministry of Environment and then the Ministry of Environment sending the messages back to them when there are disasters. So this is women beyond the vulnerable group. So this thing about innovation is, is fundamental. And the last is the impulse, the transformational change. This cannot be policies when we're talking about gender and DRR and climate change. These need to be think outside the box. Business as usual for the policies that we have in front is not the formula. So that is some of my thinking on that respect.
Excellent. Thank you very, very much, uh, Lorena. Uh, now I'm going to open up the floor for any question directed to Lorena, uh, something that you would like to find out more, or a, an opinion or a, that you would like to add on this. And we brought some documents. I don't know where they put them, some of the public I think it's outside, and because there's not a big amount of uh, documents, there is o the document is also available on an electronic format that you can download. Huh. That's the time. She was almost there. <laughs> Her time was up. Uh, so I'm opening up the floor. Do we have anyone who would like to come in and share their experience or have a question for Lorena? Uh, please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Sue Carlson, and I am the facilitator for the Women's Committee at the World Farmers Organization. I'm a woman farmer. I live in North Dakota. Um, the WFO headquarters is in Rome. And I've had the opportunity for many years to attend several of the COPs. And as a farmer, it's frustrating for us, and obviously the majority of farmers in the world are women, that even at the COP level, we don't have a farmer's working group. And we've been calling for that for years. I think if we could get the farmers to have a working group so we had the scientific knowledge that farmers can mitigate and adapt to climate change, I think this would address part of the gender issue. I think there is a big linkage, and I just don't see it happening. Well noted. Uh, I'm sure that also colleagues from uh, FAO would be interested in, in, in such an idea. Um, I think now we're going to move to the next uh, presenter. Uh, our next presenter comes from Kenya, and it's uh, Stella Aura. Uh, and Stella is a meteorologist by profession. She's currently the Deputy Director of uh, Education, Training, Research, and Development at the Kenya Meteorological Department and the principal of the Institute uh, for Meteorological Training and Research, a designated World Meteorological Organization Regional Training Center in Nairobi. And as the principal, she has been uh, for the past six years involved in training meteorologists, uh, operational hydrologists, and climate scientists for English speaking Africa. Uh, dear Stella, uh, following the intervention from Lorena, uh, who talked a little bit more about the policy level, can you now give us your experience on how can we have better gender representation within international and regional networks, you being already part of some of them, uh, who are, of course, experts in disaster risk reduction, and furthermore, as we know, most of the teachers in the developing world especially are female, right, are women, uh, how could we get more girls to study sciences and, 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 and try to take them towards um, disaster risk reduction? Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Um, on the issue of ensuring that uh, there is gender balanced uh, representation within international and regional networks of experts, um, I think one of the main things that need to be looked at are legal and uh, policy frameworks. Um, I'll give an example of the Constitution of Kenya, uh, uh, part two, where uh, we are talking about rights and fundamental freedoms. Uh, the Constitution uh, talks about women and men having a right to equal treatment, including the right to equal opportunities in political, economic, and cultural, and social spheres. And uh, it binds the, states, the state to take legislative and other measure, measures, including affirmative action programs and policies designed to redress uh, the disadvantage suffered by individuals or groups due to past discrimination. And finally, our constitution uh, states that uh, the state shall take legislative and other measures to implement the principle that not more than two thirds of the members of elective and appointive bodies shall be of the same gender. Uh, in this respect, then, the, when it comes to recruitment or training, uh, whatever we are doing, we try as much as possible 
to follow the constitution and have a, follow the rule, the two thirds to one third uh, rule. Of course, there are challenges here in the implementation, uh, mainly because of politics, and also there are some people, men and women, uh, Kenyans, who think that uh, this is unfair. Uh, we also have a policy in place where all school, all uh, children of school age, uh, going age must go to school. Uh, this is one of the policies, but of course the challenge is that uh, some communities uh, are not ready to allow their children to go to school. Like in the pastoralist communities, uh, the boys, the parents may want the boys to look after the cattle and maybe the girls to help their mothers or maybe fetch water. Uh, those are some of the challenges. I also came, uh, about, I, I came across an example from the Sadak region, the South African uh, Development Community, which has put in place key legal and uh, policy frameworks that form part of the influence chain in shaping the response to gender inequality in Sadak. And we can borrow from this uh, WMO could borrow from this because these frameworks, they set international and regional norms and standards that SADC member states have committed to and continue to progressively integrate into their do domestic policies. And uh, they have also inspired the development of groundbreaking sub-regional instruments promoting gender equality. So if we can come up with norms and standards that are acceptable to the WMO community, we can try to progressively adapt them. On the point of uh, women teachers, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, uh, using the, the opportunity of the teachers to, the female teachers to encourage more girls to study science uh, needed to focus weather and climate related risks. Um, these teachers could be encouraged or empowered to be weather stroke climate champions or to identify girls and boys who can be weather and climate uh, champions and hence be role models to school girls. The teachers could also assist in the formation of uh, mentorship groups or identify girls they can mentor into the science. They can also facilitate debates and uh, discussions on weather and climate. They could establish award systems for girls in science or provide incentives or even inspire the girls to study the science. Uh, the teachers can establish a system of monitoring and evaluation at various levels of education to strengthen the system. And uh, I thought uh, documentation, uh, dissemination and sharing of experiences and cases would be important to motivate and create interest as well as educate the other, other communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Stella, for your intervention. Uh, you covered both uh, national level and regional level, and also gave us some ideas about uh, the educational part. Again, uh, I'm only opening up the floor for a couple of interventions. If you have on these uh, couple of areas, how could we uh, increase the um, uh, presence of women in uh, regional and international networks or even at national level. And then if you have other experiences to share about uh, how we can increase uh, the number of uh, women studying sciences and uh, especially sciences that uh, are related to uh, climate services. Yes. Thank you. My name is Evelyn Guleka. I'm the acting president of the World Farm Organization. I would like to just make a comment on Stella's intervention because she mentioned SADC, and I fall under SADC. I'm coming from Zambia, and I'm a member of SADC. And um, I think what we have found as member countries of these regional bodies is that a number of times I think we have political will of people representing us who go to sign statutory instruments which are not actually implemented. So I think there has to be a way 
of making people accountable of what they have signed to. What she has uh, mentioned is a very good example. The other one is the Maputo Declaration of 10% of uh, national budgets of agriculture. Most of the countries signed to it. How many countries have done that? So we have to find a way of making our governments responsible for what they sign for. Yes, Lorena, please uh, come on. Yes, I, I think the issue of accountability is fundamental. Um, last year, um, thinking about that, I mean, a lot of countries have um, agreed to do certain type of things under various convention and uh, under various forum. We created environmental gender index that looks precisely at the uh, interconnection between gender and environment and when a lot of decisions has been made. Um, I can share it with you later. But it does follow, for example, if a country said that they were going to do X, Y, and Z, how do they address that in the national reports that they submit to uh, Hyogo Framework for Action? Or how do that look at, at the national report that they do at UNFCCC? And that is a way, now we have a, a baseline to ask them for accountability, but I think it is fundamental that we have mo those instruments uh, more available. You're absolutely correct, and uh, based on my experience, at least uh, when I was based in Africa, we had the same issue with the science and technology budget. African member states have uh, signed up for a 1%, and since they signed up, which is more than 30 years, this has never been implemented. Yes. So we never had more than 1% of the GDP uh, allocated for science and technology. And I think that that is also maybe a root of all this. So implementation, yes, of actually of what we say. Um, thank you very much for your intervention. Uh, I'm going to move now to my left. And uh, I'm going to introduce our next uh, speaker, who is uh, Dr. Annalise Flores. Uh, Annalise is an international consultant specialized in local development, sustainable natural resource management, and climate adaptation. She recently coordinated uh, the action research, including community resilience priorities in the post-HFA agenda. And she has a long history of uh, building partnership for development based on sustainable natural resource management, with emphasis on supporting communities, particularly grassroots women. Uh, Annalise, can you please share with us your experience on how to increase the involvement of women on uh, weather and climate-related capacity building uh, activities and, uh, and how we can, in general, mainstream them. Thanks, Alex, and also thanks to you, UN Women um, uh, Government Organization for this invitation. Um, I, am going, I am going to focus my presentation on partnerships between grassroots women and local governments. Uh, I'm going to use three examples from Latin America um, because I am working on with a communitarian practitioner platform that is a network and that is uh, work on resilience campaigns and, resili and disaster restitution processes around the world. And Suranjana is part of this organization too. Well, uh, I'm going to talk with you about Grutz Peru, this the first experience. Um, the second one is going to be Guagucha in Honduras, and the third one is going to be Rosa de Montaña in Venezuela. Um, the first example is, is Grutz Peru that is working in, on something that they called, uh, an approach that they call step-by-step step, step step building community resilience. They are work with the communities um, to define, to plan disaster reduction uh, policies, but involving local authorities after having the community very well organized. And then they define the process in two phases. The first one is organize the community and, and mapping with them the vulnerabilities and the threats on the field and the ground with them and train the community. And the second phase is implementing the planning with the local authorities sit down in the, on the table, in the table. 
okay. Uh, the process to build this step by step, as I told you, is first they organize the community they are around to the community, organize the people that mainly are women because the women are show more curiosity all the time. Um, they select uh, the group that has a, at least one interest to develop uh, into the community, and they use the disaster risk reduction and the vulnerabilities as a starting point to conversations. And mainly the, the women are very uh, aware about, talk about the, the threats and the vulnerabilities, but understanding that this is a process that they are going to receive a training and maybe they are going to have the access to the local authorities, they decide to be part of the process. After that, it start a process of training and this uh, groups Peru have a group of facilitators that is women like them that talk in the same terms and it's very easy to them to have a per by per uh, exchange. This training after is um, the, the following the following step is to have a plan consolidation. Uh, but the community is really involved in this the mapping and the planning because they define the priorities. Um, they have a public presentation to the community, uh, prioritizing the things that the community, the needs and the priorities that they want to, to present to the local authorities. And after that, they have the presentation to the local authorities and they defined an action plan to, um, to move forward and to gain some resources including the, from the local authorities. There is a very, very interesting situation because we are talking about grass women, grassroots women, like, like any women that we find anywhere at the global level, but the people very well prepared and leader in their own places and knowing that know very well the, their territories, and that is very important. This approach is, it was created by themselves. Um, for me, it was a very amazing to hear about two, two majors in Lima, when I was there uh, making the case study, um, for instance, the um, mayor from Comas told me that they want to, to work with these women because they are very clear, and I was hearing this morning the, the panel saying that the energy, talking about the energy of the women, they say, he said that these women are dynamite. Uh, said, yes, they are, because the women in the, in the ground always have the commitment, and maybe in the beginning the women have to be involved, but after have the commitment to be there, they move forward very fast, and it's very clear to achieve the goal at the end. This is a, my, my first example. Um, I think the, the second one is Guagucha from Honduras. That's very interesting because Guagucha works, it's a Garifuna, an indigenous uh, group that work in Honduras in disaster resolution too and resilience process. But they was created uh, during the Mitch hurricane after to, to have an emergency process after the hurricane. It was very interesting because they decided to be involved in this platform, the community platform for resilience, and they started to be trained, and now they work in a methodology or an approach that they call cantarranas. Uh, it's similar to the step-by-step, -step, but in this case, they, they exchange experience uh, with uh, another communities around in, in Central America, but they involve, since the beginning, the local authorities into the process because they, clo they work very closely with the UNISDR Resilience Series campaign, and this is the, the gaining to the community. But uh, in the case of Guagucha, they achieved to sit down together Majors from different cities in this of, of, from, from Central America, excuse me, from Central America. We are talking about Nicaragua, Honduras, and Guatemala. Um, they have the same process of training, exchanging information, but the local authorities, sorry, the local authorities are part of the process, uh, like one of them, and it's very good because after having the planning, they decide to to be a, a huge commitment and agreement with the local, the local and the women sit down together to, to do this. Uh, my last example is from Venezuela. That is the different situation because 
the local government decide to have an engagement with, uh, with the women, with the grass women, to develop an uh, ecological corridor in a, in a center in the, in the middle of the valley of Caracas. That's very interesting because that government really well understand the, the need to be sit down and work closely with the local communities. But in the beginning, I was working with the local authorities. They decided to have uh, an engagement with any uh, basement organization, ground organization. But when we start to work together in the Pedregal, the women arrive to the meeting. The men never appear. That's the reality. The women have uh, the, the need to, be, to share and to be part of the process. And I want to finalize, that because I, I don't have too much time, uh, emphasizing three things that are very important to me in this process. These, these grassroots leader, uh, women are leaders, are acting as experts. And it's very good because it's, not a, it's an equilibrated situation. The local authorities, the national authorities are in the same plane with them, working together. And for me, it's very, that is very important. The second one is this, um, it's the importance of this relationship to move forward in terms of to establish disaster risk reduction and resilience programs very close to the ground. No, not only policies in, in, the, in the sky, very close to the reality, the, the real life. And the, th the third one is, in all the cases that I, I was checking and studying, uh, all the cases, the national government, the local authorities, and the grassroots women said that it was a win-win relationship. Everybody win. And this is very good because it's, an, it's a permanent negotiation because it's not only mapping or not only having a plan. We have to move forward to really uh, gain uh, very well programs on disaster reduction and resilience, but move forward faster to uh, the sustainable development goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annalise. Uh, again, uh, we turn to you now for uh, your input. You heard three very fascinating examples from uh, Annalise on how things can be done. Examples coming from uh, South and uh, Central America. Uh, do you have anything um, close to it to share with everyone? Or you have any comment for, uh, or a question for Annalise? Okay, the lady in the back. I'm going to get back to you too. Yes, now it's working. Thank you. Um, my name is Lesha Whitmer. I chair the Committee for Environment, Sustainable Development and Water of Business and Professional Women International. <clears throat> um, I basically have a, a question, I would think, for, for all three panelists so far. Um, how do you figure out and how do you acknowledge, respect, incorporate the knowledge that these women already have? Because my impression is that in a lot of cases they are already working on weather climate related issues, although they may not call it that, they might have a different label, a different name for it. Um, and I would think it's extremely important to see what their already acquired knowledge and capacities are before you go to the next stage, because you might be seriously underestimating them. And how do you make the connection with modern science? Because in the end, that's, I think, what you're trying to, to do, involve the knowledge already there locally, with one, what comes from science or other policy levels. I'm, sorry. I'm gonna go first to uh, our colleague in the back and then I'll come to you. Thank you very much. My name is Yvette Beckford Dawkins. I'm a meteorologist. I've since uh, retrained as a teacher and what I wanted to say was uh, on the matter of retention of scientists in the field. Um, sometimes in some countries, flexi working is not readily available. And then there comes the conflict of family and working, sometimes long hours, sometimes shifts. If you're not relieved, you might have a double shift. 
and at traveling, sometimes to collect data. As a result, I've personally seen where some women have decided to leave for jobs that offer a little bit more predictability, so to speak. So I just wanted to find out how, if the panel has any suggestions or would like to address, how we could all work together to retain the women we already have. Thank you. Thank you, and then to the gentleman, and we close with the questions for the time being. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Adidas Namanya from Uganda, and I work as a health geographer in the Ministry of Health. My question is to all the panelists. I believe that we need to work together, men and women, boys and girls. It seems to me that the emphasis since this morning is about women. And we cannot go it alone. I believe that we need to work together. Whether it's women groups, they need to find a way of involving men. Otherwise, it may not work. Because uh, if we work together, we make big steps. But if we go it alone, we cannot make much progress. So. To the panelists, how can we work together to make bigger steps? I thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm um, turning to uh, the panelists. Uh, who would like to take uh, the first question on uh, how you go about um, assessing the, the current capacity of the, uh, the, the women that you are working with before you go and, and you do the capacity building component and then and how you connect it to the science. Uh, then we're going to go to, to Sura and Zana. Um, who wants to pick this one up? You want Annalise? Okay. We could talk about preconditions. Now, with the platform, how long is the platform? 10 years? The, the community platform is not a, a old organization. It's a five-year organization. But you know, uh, it's a networking. Uh, and sometimes the, 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 the main challenge is to convince the first group. And we, we have some people like uh, Wagusha. It was, the, it was one of the first organizations involved in this, in this networking. And it's very important because they understand the, the, the need to be involved in disaster reduction programs. Okay, but. Wagucha brought another, and when you start to work, you can recognize people that is working, and you have people working specifically in disaster reduction around the world. If you think about in your own country, there are a lot of people, maybe they don't, take, they don't talk about resilience, they talk about uh, keep water, uh, to work uh, with the best practice on agriculture, they are working on keeping water, they are working on uh, uh, alarm system, very, very, very um, custom alarm system, but they are working, the people work on, with the natural resources all the time. That is our main group, I think so, um, because uh, the people, need to have the opportunity to be part of something that is, is going to be good. And the women, sorry for the third one <laughs> question, but the women all the time is available to hear because it's, it's at the communities. And it's, if you arrive to the community with, with women like them, not me maybe because I am a scientist, but people like them talking in the same terms, talking about the same problems, it's easier to be connected. And for us, it's not easy, but it's easier than for others because our language is, 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 is easier, to, easier to understand and our approach is have a success with another community. I think this is the main goal that, to achieve. Thank you. Uh, do you want to come in? Stella, okay. Yeah, uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, what we do in, in, with regard to the 
assessing the level of knowledge. What we do, at least at my institute, is that uh, if we have to go out and uh, deal with the people out in the field, we do some kind of assessment to decide at what level these people are. Um, of course, there are issues of indigenous knowledge. Some of the people out in the rural areas have indigenous knowledge. And uh, working with the IGAD Climate Prediction and Application Center, we've tried to document any indigenous knowledge that is there and try to link it up with the, with the science. Uh, excuse me. On the Flexi Work Program, this would be a policy issue. And uh, I remember at some point I was in China and I was asking why some, uh, the ladies were not on shift. And uh, I think they told me that it was a deliberate effort not to put the ladies on shift because of uh, the responsibilities that they have. So this, I think, would depend on the country and uh, it, it has to be a policy issue. And if WMO wants to push for it, just like you're asking, if WMO can assist us push for uh, to implement some of these um, policies that are on paper, like what my friend from Zambia was talking about, things that are on paper like health, in, uh, uh, governments are, I think are supposed to put aside 10 to 15 percent of their GDP for health, this is not done. You know, some of these things maybe can be pushed from the international level, uh, and uh, that is my take on it. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Stella. Uh, Lorena, uh, you want to uh, pick up the last uh, question that we had from uh, the gentleman on how to involve men in this? Yes, well, um, there are various processes that we can both uh, do, both at the community level or at a higher level. We have uh, most of our work, it's done with mixed groups. And uh, there is no intention to put man on the side. For example, in our gender team, we have a lot of almost half and half women and, and men working on board. But it's also very important that when you address these issues, men need to understand that they come to this um, arena bringing their own set of issues and understandings that might not be the same ones that you're going to find in the women that are working on, on gender issues. And there is a need also to combine those efforts and, and to move forward and to see them from different perspectives. There's a lot of work that is being done on masculinity. Um, I think that it's a way, but there's also a lot of networks worldwide that are working on gender issues from a man's uh, point of view, and I think that is something that needs to be addressed. And then we can work together, but it's not also always easy to find uh, sometimes those arenas to discuss these processes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to move to the next speaker and then I will give you the floor uh, so that at least we have a, an overview of all the issues that we would like to, to cover. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Suranzan Gupta, uh, who is an advisor to the Community Resilience Land and Housing Campaign of uh, Huayru Commission, which is a global coalition that promotes grassroots women's leadership in sustainable resilient development. She has a career that spans over 20 years and worked with a women's group around the world to develop grassroots-friendly frameworks on disaster resilience, design multi-country grassroots-led resilience initiatives, train policy makers, undertake research, and facilitate learning exchanges and dialogues. Um, dear Suranjana, could you please uh, pick up now the issue of increasing awareness and education on issues of uh, climate in uh, climate service and information uh, with uh, marginalized women. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, I'm uh, I'm very tempted also to answer a couple of the questions, but let me uh, hope it sort of um, comes into my presentation. I think where the question of marginalized women are concerned, um, my network focuses specifically on grassroots women's organizations. So we're talking about organized groups of women who live and work in poor communities, which are characterized by insecure housing, poor access to basic services, poor infrastructure, and unstable income. So, we're talking about this set of people who are uh, generally um, marginalized from decision-making processes. 
And um, I think one of the things I would add to the discussion here on the issue of where does their local knowledge come in, I think all the groups that we work with on issues of disaster resilience and climate resilience come to it from development. They have development practices which they have developed over time and that essentially have some sort of built-in resilience, if I can call it that, um, without using all the, the jargon that goes with this field of work because these practices actually emerge from crisis that grassroots women face every day in their communities, whether it's around livelihoods, food security, uh, around dealing with drought and collecting water or facing evictions. It, so it, it comes from, uh, is built out of crises that local communities face. And our network is very much focused on supporting grassroots women to address development issues that are very much linked to their aspirations that they have for their families and their communities. And that's how I would answer the question of where are men in these processes and where are men and boys and don't you need them on board? Yes, absolutely, very much so. And the way that grassroots women are doing it is to address issues that concern not just women exclusively, but families and communities. So. I want to give a couple of uh, quick examples just to give a sense of the kind of public roles that grassroots women are playing in different contexts. So uh, the first example is from Swam Shikshan Prayog, which is, works in Maharashtra in India, has um, uh, primarily small and marginal farmers who uh, work, um, who depend on rain-fed agriculture. And women's groups here have formed vegetable, organic vegetable farming groups. They've negotiated with um, the government agricultural research institutes and with agricultural extension services to actually give them technical support, which is usually provided only for larger landholders and men who own the land. Women don't own the land that they work. And they've also negotiated for land either uh, collectively leasing it or negotiating it from their families to grow food crops to address the food security needs. And in addition, there's been in this uh, experiment about 500 farmers who are sort of testing the use of using SMS services for weather uh, related um, information. Now, there's similar examples where grassroots groups are uh, experimenting with different kinds of strategies around growing food on small plots of land and convincing agricultural extension services to actually support them by providing te regular technical support. So we have similar work going on in Kenya and in Uganda. Um, the second example is more around urban work that some of the groups are doing. For example, we work with a, a network of 200 plus um, community-based organizations, mainly in urban areas of the Philippines called DAMPA, and they negotiated with their national government um, and local government, as well as Manila, the public-private um, corporation that provides water supply to actually set up infrastructure and distribute water in their settlements. Uh, they also work a lot on uh, improving sanitation. And a more recent example uh, of their work on social accountability is where they are working with local barangay officials to monitor uh, health service delivery um, in five or six government clinics. But we have similar examples of monitoring health service delivery or making health systems work better for the poor um, in Vietnam, where they have um, you know, strategies around reducing mosquito populations and, um, and then we have also in India following the tsunami a lot of work done with um, health workers that was also around um, uh, preventing uh, epidemics. So um, 
that just to sort of give you an, a, a sense of the kind of work that grassroots women are doing when we say, you know, they have agency, uh, so they are playing, you know, roles of um, people who are mobilizing communities to understand risks, but also to monitor service delivery and to build uh, partnerships with local authorities, government, so on. So what about these, the outcomes of these kinds of strategies really uh, is empowering to grassroots women? Number one, it improves the quality of life for their families and communities. So it's hard for people to be involved in DRR when it's only about emergency preparedness somehow. You can't keep people engaged 365 days of the year, especially when they're poor, when, when they are, their actual concern is everyday survival and livelihoods and food security. So, so these are things which are changing the quality of life in very practical, everyday ways in their settlements. Number two, of course, they're protecting their communities from the adverse impacts of disasters and climate change. So that's an important thing. And number three, they're really establishing grassroots women as leaders as real stakeholders, people who come to the table with knowledge, with expertise, with understanding. So invariably, grassroots women have done risk mapping in their settlements. They've worked collectively to come up with solutions that they've tried out on their own. So they come to the table not as beneficiaries asking for handouts, but they have something very concrete to offer. So, we have a community resilience fund through which we've been trying to resource grassroots groups to prioritize uh, local actions, to, to drive action by actually testing um, and experimenting uh, with, um, with solutions for themselves, but also with, uh, we use this fund to incentivize engagement with local governments. And um, our work is very much focused on building solidarity and information networks among grassroots groups, allowing them to transfer learning. So positioning them not just as learners and people who receive information and training, but also people who communicate it and who are, who are uh, trainers and teachers themselves. And of course, facilitating grassroots interface with partners and local authorities. We know that although there are many um, there are legislations, decentralized mechanisms, and budgets assigned at the local level or national level. Often grassroots groups do not know about these. There are no engagement mechanisms for them to formally engage in discussions, be involved in planning. So we support grassroots groups to do this work. And lastly, on the issue of what kinds of suggestions or recommendations we can come up with in this forum? I think the thing we have to remember, at least from my point of view, when we're talking about women's empowerment, and particularly grassroots women's empowerment, we have to remember that information is power. And we, from an empowerment perspective, we want to take action that reconfigures power equations between grassroots women and other actors. And therefore, I think we have to keep in mind that we, we have to think about who owns information. You know, we, we're having a lot of discussions now about the need for da disaggregated data, the need for more information, data, research. But who owns this research? Who owns the knowledge that comes out of research? There's often serious questions with which grassroots groups have where they find that they're constantly the object of other people's research. So we have to think about how we design research strategies in a way that groups get something out of it, something practical that they have in their hands that they can use to negotiate with. Secondly, the question of who communicates and transmits information. This is a big part of how groups are empowered. We have examples in our network of how people have used communication technologies that were actually provided for emergency preparedness, but these have actually supported them to build their networks and connect to other actors and resources. So this is, this is I think, a very important piece of the work that we do together should be around supporting grassroots women's groups to go from 
accessing information, to understanding and analyzing it, to communicating it, and testing out actions that actually um, apply this information. So we, we want to sort of go through the whole cycle. So I would suggest that one of the starting points could be that we create, perhaps at the global level, but also at the country levels, the working groups that put together grassroots organizations with various professional groups and scientists and communications people to really package and to think about how we can design a package that takes grassroots women from accessing information right up to what actions they can take to act on the information they get to build resilience to climate change and disasters. So. Thank you, Suranjana. Do we have any uh, input from the floor now? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, Program Director. I think my question or my, my input will be directed to the question that has been raised, that uh, we seem to be really addressing uh, women issues and maybe forgetting that uh, we are all in this together, also with men. I think um, um, when I was doing my presentation, I also emphasized the issue of gender balance. And, and, and there are practical ways that we can look at in making sure that we also include men in the process. One of the speakers talk about STEM, science, technology, in, uh, engineering, and, and maths, that it has been an area that has been uh, mainly male-dominated. But then that is an opportunity for us. One, as we develop tools in terms of information and knowledge management, we need to have programs that are looking at mentorship and also coaching. And we can actually use these male counterparts that have got experience in that area and provide incentives for them to do that work. Um, uh, uh, for, for, for example, in South Africa, one of the areas which is very important as, as the med service is provision of uh, weather information to um, aviation industry. That area has been dominated by males. And the key person who is actually going on retirement was a male. But we agreed to develop a program. And now we've got a number of females, the lady sitting next to me, she's running that uh, uh, division very well. So I think it's very important as we develop and implement these policies, because we also don't want at the end to have men that are marginalized and boys that are also marginalized. Um, coming to the also the dissemination of information, if you look at, 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 at local community level, uh, you will find that when you interact very closely, I'll use example of, of chiefs. Chiefs are mostly males, but if when you come in and communicate the benefits of having to share the information with females that are dealing with the day-to-day -day activities, whether it's agriculture, whether it's water management and all that, they are willing to assist the scientists and others to identify, because in each and every community, you've got well-respected women leaders. They are willing to assist in identifying those. Then we are in a position to develop networks that are addressing both. So it's very important that when we do that, we look at that culture and in our communication as leaders who are already there who are females that who also working with males and not marginalize them. So I think there are examples of looking at that very closely and identifying males, when you look at information and knowledge management, also identify males who've got this expertise. Some of them, they've retired, but their minds are still running. How do you use the retirees to actually train the up and coming and have a number of understudies and make a conscious decision to have a balance in terms of males and females. Thank you very much. Thank you. As they used to say, you are retired but not tired, right? So, okay, thank you very much for your intervention. Uh, now that uh, we have closed the round of uh, 
presentations by uh, our panelists and uh, providing you their experiences on uh, the issue at hand today. Uh, we will turn to you. As I said in the beginning, this is a working session, so we expect from you now to give us your input. Uh, our colleagues from WMO, I'm repeating, have distributed three uh, papers to you. One has a series of questions. If you see, these are the same questions that our panelists responded to. So one has to do with policy. Uh, it's made uh, in initially how we integrate uh, uh, gender into policy, so it will be possible to have more women in all aspects of decision making, of participation, etc. The other one has to do with capacity. How do we increase uh, women's uh, uh, integration to different capacity building uh, activities? So you will see there are five questions. Uh, and we will need now your input in these five questions. There is yet another uh, page which has only one line and it, it talks about your recommendation. So what we would like to do is to have uh, groups of close to six people. You can arrange yourselves. Unfortunately, the, uh, the room is not the optimum to have group work being done. So if you may, Please, the people in the front, turn and face the people in the back. Form a team of six people. Identify that one person that will come up and give us the recommendation. And uh, at the end, we, we're going to dedicate to this 15 minutes. You can have as many recommendations as you want, but please identify one recommendation that the group will present. We are locking the door so nobody can leave. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have 15 minutes so that we have also some time to present that. And what we want is we want also a balance on the issues. So please try to, to think about all the issues, not only cover, let's say, the policy, not only cover a practical recommendation on how do we increase the participation of women in capacity building, uh, in decision making, etc. Okay, so try to uh, think about all the questions. Don't focus only on one. But uh, you will decide on one question to provide us. And we have 15 minutes starting now. I'm sure that this will also make easier the cocktail session. You will already know people around you. So 15 minutes. Please turn to your uh, neighbors, create your team, and we are going to go around to, to help you. You found them? Okay, it seems that some papers didn't make it to the left. Uh, actually, that paper is just asking for a recommendation. What can we do? You have a set of questions. So what would be the group's recommendation on what we can do? And then who can help us do that and how? I'm coming to you.
because she's going to take us a photo. Okay, uh, colleagues, I think it's uh, time to close the session slowly but surely and uh, move upstairs for the, uh, the cocktail. So uh, we need to wrap it up and I will ask you now to provide us with your recommendation orally, each group from where it's standing. We're going to start from the left. And we're going to move towards the right side of the room. Uh, we need from each group to present in the language of their preference their recommendation, okay, uh, for everyone to hear. And then uh, I would uh, really appreciate it if you provide us with your input, the paper that you have put all your ideas in, uh, to our colleague, uh, Sophie, Sophie, can you please stand up? So, so Sophie is located right here. Please, after the session, the end of the session, provide us with your input to our colleagues. So this way we can capture all your ideas, all your recommendations. But for the time being, we need one recommendation per group. So I'm going to start with our Francophone group. Uh, in, uh, in the back on the left. Uh, are you ready? You can present from where you are. You don't need to come here. So this is a front group. He's presenting his recommendation in English. <laughs> so, 
The recommendation we have put is to take the opportunity offered by the capacity of mobilization of women. We know that women in Africa have somewhere else also good capacity, capacity to mobilize persons. They have a lot of grouping for many things and to take this opportunity to sensitize them and to deliver uh, weather and climate information. Oh. Speak okay. in the mic because we cannot hear you, and if you don't... Do you have translation? So no, no. Speak it. Oh, okay. oh, it's just for hearing. Mm -hmm. So the recommendation we put here is to take the opportunity offered by the capacity of mobilization of women. There are many women grouping, particularly in Africa, to take this opportunity to use this grouping to sensitize women of the value of climate information and to deliver uh, through this grouping weather and climate information. Targeting actor is first the national hydrometeorological services, but also local and governmental authorities. Means of implementation, we think first is, the first thing is to identify some of these women groupings, to link partnership with them and develop appropriate training materials, particularly in local languages, and based maybe on images, video, or whatever. And also think for resource, resources and identify way to disseminate information. If it is, for example, through uh, community radios, uh, through uh, cell phones, through direct contact with grouping, something to identify with these groupings. Thanks. Thank you. And now we're going to move uh, towards this side. So can we have the second group that was there to uh, present? And I think there was a second group and then we had the first. OK. So can we have then the group, which is almost ready, no? You ready? Yeah. OK. We have looked at the question one. And our recommendation is going to focus mostly on question one. The first recommendation, um, I'll just try to tie them together. We say that uh, it is important to build on existing knowledge in the different communities and also to use simplified uh, message uh, so that the women in the different communities uh, will be able to participate fully in uh, disaster risk reduction, uh, and also to have tailor-made uh, messages to suit those different communities. The target actor, we said it was uh, the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services, uh, together with organizations responsible for disaster risk reduction, uh, as well as the GFCS. The means of implementation, uh, we agreed that it was important to have innovation platforms where uh, the technical people would work together with uh, the communities and have exchange of information. Uh, it was also important to do baseline surveys as well as uh, to involve the media in disseminating the information. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'm going to move to the third group from this side. Yes. Okay, our group decided that uh, dissemination was the most important uh, recommended action, that the dissemination should be tailor-made um, in order to meet the needs of both men and women. And the means of implementation should be that there perhaps would be needed to be using different forms of media, and sometimes that media could be uh, using some sponsorships or Otherwise, it needs to be free because otherwise it won't be available to everybody. Also, the actions need to be at appropriate times. We were remembering that somebody was saying the men and women had different activities at different times of the day. And that it needed to use non-technical language or layman's language so that people could understand. 
and we said that the target actors could be the National Met Services, uh, appropriate NGOs, that WMO could give some recommendations and leads in providing material, and also the Department of Education in the countries could be helping with the dissemination or education at um, school level. Thank you. Okay, so basically we're covering the capacity uh, development and, uh, and the raising awareness issue from your group. Okay, thank you very much. Now I'm going to go to our Hispanophone group, but unfortunately, since we don't have uh, translation services, we will need you to, to speak in English. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, we will try to speak in English, so I'm sorry. Uh, I think we had the same idea as the previous group, and we thought about that uh, we need to improve uh, the communication that we had with the communities, with the med service, because it's a big gap that we had. And because sometimes we, as a med service, are more uh, uh, working or uh, our focus is to deliver very good forecasts and early warnings, but we don't care much about how the people get the information. Uh, we don't care much about the uh, language we use. So I think uh, it is important to, we need to close that gap. Um, we know that there is a different sector that we need to give different information and include the information that we received to WMO through the uh, Global Framework for Climate Services, we need to start working closely with the users uh, and also to ask them how they receive the information and what they need from the MET services. And this is the main thing. And so. Um, the target actor is mainly the med services. They need to work with the national emergency office and, and local government office in charge for disaster um, risk office and different sectors. And I think uh, we need to, the way to implement this uh, action is mainly to work with different group with the stakeholders and to try to find, uh, and also with the decision makers, and review all the policies guidelines and the way that we as a med service, we are delivering the information. This is mainly uh, what, is, what was our discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to go to the group in the back. Uh, Ms. Dawkins, no? Uh, I guess she will speak on Good evening, of everybody. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, our group was made up of representatives from the UK, Barbados, Sri Lanka, Kenya, Jamaica, Papua New Guinea. And we thought that what we wanted to put forward as the action was to look at uh, employment structures. And we thought the target actor would be to start first at the institutional level with um, developing some kind of flexibility approach to working and sensitivity to family responsibilities. And for the means of implementation, we thought that it would be beneficial to have some kind of research on what works best, basically, for you. So we would talk to those who were actually involved. So that would have to be according to the users. And then use that information to inform policy and hopefully to find a satisfactory solution for the policymakers and those who are actually delivering uh, the service. Thank you very much. Now uh, we're going to move further down. Uh, we have a group here.
thank you. In, in our group, we saw what's the recommendation for what should be done to ensure the weather and climate service and gender sensitive. One, uh, give a training about gender to all members of, uh, from high managers to middle level to all people in the organization uh, in weather and climate service to promote the, the education and awareness for disaster risk reduction through training, encourage women in organization to build knowledge, skill, and contribute. And for tar target actor, international, national legisl legislation, employment, laws, policy, and strategy, all members in images, all men, all gives WMO, internal organization and organization authorities. Means of implementation uh, by using, implementing, implementing policy and strategy, gives in intensive training uh, to give training in master's, PhD, and degree in MIT and hydrology, subjects through NMH, NMHS, WM organization, give in intensive training, build the mechanisms. In the women's organization agenda need to include it in climate and weather disaster adaptation, risk adaptation. This is our recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then uh, I'm going to move. We had a group here, right? And then uh, I'm going to move in the back. Okay. I think you have an other yeah, we have a group there and there. After. Okay. Um, so uh, there are actually three of us <laughs> who did the discussion and uh, Based on our discussion, we have come up with uh, uh, some suggestions uh, on the um, uh, education and capacity building on DRR. Uh, one of the, um, I think we have also heard this from other groups that uh, training is very important on disaster preparedness. Uh, this, will, this can be done at different levels, not only on um, the community itself, but um, even on the um, school children um, and uh, from uh, elementary up to higher education, DRR should be included in the curriculum. So. Um, who can do this um, um, this type of advocacy? Uh, one uh, for informal training, the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services can do uh, provide these trainings. Aside from the NGOs, can provide training on DRR, and for formal training, the uh, Ministry of Education. Um, and the Commission on Higher Education can uh, also provide training. On the international level, of course, the WMO and the, um, I think, ISDR, the uh, International um, Disaster uh, Agency, can also provide training. Uh, in other countries, uh, also, the Office of Civil Defense, who takes care of disaster um, management, can also provide training uh, in this aspect. Uh, we have other recommendations, but I think this is uh, one of the important uh, recommendations that we have in our group. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will move uh, to our group there and then at the back. Okay, thank you very much. We had a diverse group of uh, people in our group, uh, one, one fellow and mostly women, uh, from NGOs and from the MET services and farmers. So we were well represented and from all corners of the globe. 
And what we felt would be the common denominator would be um, we need, there's not just a one size fits all answer. It needs to be culturally and regionally specific, the messaging. But uh, as many of the other groups have talked about, it's the dissemination of this information. And gender isn't just men or women, it's how we view them uh, in their roles. And so, with weather and weather alerts, um, the information should be translated into an understandable format, whether it be in their language, maybe it's symbols, that uh, we heard about the, the large illiteracy rate. Those are the people, the vulnerable people, that need to have this information of weather and weather alerts. And so we thought it should be really starting with the governments and then working through all the stakeholders, through the meteorological services, the media, um, uh, leadership, maybe it's a village chief, uh, that type of thing, just to keep going down the chain. And even in schools to train uh, students what this means, whether through their curriculum. But we thought it was really important to listen to what's needed in each area. Where is that gap? Because we, we certainly don't know what that is um, on a broad scale. But we felt to implement this dissemination through local languages or <laughs> symbols or whatever it might be, that, and we've heard a lot about and we know firsthand the power of grassroots organizing to force governments to provide this information in an understandable way. And then in the reverse, for the UN agencies to you know, globally urge governments to do this to um, inform all people in an understandable and an accurate for, for, uh, format. Thank you. And our last group, I think uh, we are having them in the back. Yeah, I'll try and summar summarize uh, what was discussed here. And it's interesting how many different angles you get to the same question. <laughs> um, because we came out in a different alley. But to start with, um, we thought that the, the main goal is to make the services gender responsive. There's no point in people being gender sensitive if we're not going to act on it. So the final goal is to make the policy and the service gender responsive. Um, the second one is that I think there was a um, uh, quite an emphasis on if we uh, want to make sure that whether it's the awareness or the information or the training uh, actually reaches the people we want it to reach, that there is a gender balance, a gender mix in the people who are actually providing the service because it makes access and communication uh, a lot easier. Um, Another point that came up a couple of times here is the, um, the working conditions for the different groups. Um, if working conditions, and this goes much further than just saying, oh, the, the working times have to be flexible, but it, for instance, starts with the fact that a lot of times the right equipment is not there. Um, too big sizes, so women can't work in them. And if this happens all the time, that means that they will just say, okay, I'm not going to do it anymore. Or people not accepting that the women go into the field and do research. So the working conditions are quite crucial, and that's the employers of all the agencies that work on weather and climate change issues. And I think the, the last recommendation is very much echoing from what was said earlier. It's in extremely important to do needs assessments. And then don't say we're talking to the women, but also make sure it's the women farmers, the women fisheries, the women's household, because it's not the women. It is different needs depending on the circumstances and, and the day-to-day the -day necessities that you have. Um, and I think the implementation would be to, to make sure that a lot of the, the good ideas and the good practices um, are um, made into manuals that actually address the language and the, the needs for the different groups. So not just one at policy level, but really on the ground. I would like to thank you all for your contribution, for uh, staying until a quarter after seven, before you start uh, having a more relaxed time. 
Uh, thank you very much for your ideas. Uh, and uh, of course, I need to thank uh, also the panelists on uh, uh, this working session for uh, instigating a little bit the discussions. And just to inform you, because uh, we had uh, at least a couple of uh, groups that talked about formal education, that uh, we have at least 50 countries that have mainstream disaster risk reduction in the school curricula. Uh, in various ways, um, and uh, there is a mapping exercise that uh, UNESCO did with UNICEF on that, and that uh, actually we have gone one step further and we have developed on guidelines on how to, uh, because you have to work with planners within your Ministry of Education and with your curriculum developers to do this exercise. So that's one, and then since I'm also coming from UNESCO, always, you know, the element of culture uh, as uh, our last speaker said, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And we have different uh, groups that we have to identify and work with, and different cultural backgrounds, and we have to work within uh, this. Uh, not just, you know, think that every, everybody will uh, comprehend things the same way, everybody will act the same way. Thank you very, very much for being so patient with us. And uh, I hope I will be seeing you upstairs pretty soon, enjoying a more relaxed time with a drink in my hand. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm